Hello. Three minutes after ten is the time. How much? How many minutes can I? Did I do this at the top of yesterday's show? How much time can I spend discussing the uh, the minutiae and the machinations of deciding what to talk about on the program before we actually get onto the things that we've decided to talk about on the program? I'm going to make a confession very briefly. I, I, I can't. I don't know how to get into the strikes anymore. I, I, I can't just do another hour asking you if you still support the nurses. I'm very clear on why the nurses are likely to reject the latest pay offer. I think the two R's, the key words, recruitment and retention, remain uh, absolutely front and centre on that, in addition, obviously, to, to remuneration. Oh, three R's, recruitment, retention and remuneration. That's, that's, but I don't, know, I don't know that there's much else to add, and yet I feel that it's something that quite rightly leads to the news agenda, and therefore we should be talking about. So um, if you want to have a crack at coming up with a treatment of that topic that lends itself to uh, scintillating hour of phone in radio then you know how to get in touch I, I, what i'm going to do instead at 10 o'clock this morning at the top of the show today is something that i, I don't think i've been fighting shy of it but I, i've been i, I kind of I, i'm a little i don't like simple answers to complicated questions until they turn out to be true at which point i fall in love with them i, I mean there is nothing finer than a simple answer to a complicated question that's actually correct but they are rarer than hen's teeth and this tale of voter id the fact that when you get to the uh, the booths, the voting booths on May the 4th in England for the local elections, you will be required to provide ID of a kind that you have never been required to provide before. Photo ID to get your ballot papers in local elections in England, police and crime commissioner elections in England and Wales, and latterly, UK parliamentary election. So although in the first instance this is relevant chiefly to people voting or hoping to vote in England, it will eventually reach all corners of the United Kingdom and therefore remains obviously relevant. How important is it? Now, there is every chance, if you're one of the people who's been texting or tweeting me over the last few months uh, explaining why I absolutely need to cover this, there is every chance that you already know more about this than I do, for which I can only apologise. Nobody can keep all the plates spinning all the time. I am aware, for example, that some ID appears to be age discriminatory. If you've got an over 60-something Oyster card with your picture on it, you can use it as voter ID, but if you've got one for younger people, you can't, as I understand it. And that... Um, that's pretty shocking, right? And then you have the warning today from the Electoral Commission that, uh, well, first of all, a quarter of people still don't know that it will be required. And secondly, there are uh, worries that the local government association from the local government association are going to be able to cope. The practical difficulties faced by councils to bring about these rule changes should not be underestimated. Now, I... I can't see a reason to do this from where I'm sitting today other than a deliberate hope stroke attempt to reduce the number of people that can vote in the local elections or in any election moving forward. I, I don't, I mean, I've looked for the numbers. I, I, I but there was big talk not long ago about voter fraud in, in Tower Hamlets, but I've looked, I've looked for the numbers on people getting into trouble for actually doing this and I can only find one and it's so hard to find one case that I couldn't actually find what what the what the specific offence was a lot of the rhetoric which often had a slightly racist tinge to it was about postal votes and people were submitting postal votes on mass allegedly and 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 and, and I think there were, the wrongdoing had been identified but this doesn't affect that this this isn't going to affect that. I, I haven't been able to find more than one example so far of somebody turning up to vote who shouldn't have done, that could have been somehow prevented from voting if they um, if they didn't have if they'd had voter ID, if they'd had photographic photographic documentation. So why do you think it's been done? 03456060973. It's on May the 4th. A quarter of people... I, I can't really do this, can I, as a phone? And give me a ring if you didn't know about this. Do you have any voter ID on you right now? Do you? Anything at all? 
you carry your driver's license with you all the time. A lot of people do that. I, I guess I've got three strands of inquiry going on this one. The, 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 the first is, why the hell are they doing it? It looks very dodgy to me. 03456060973. The second is, how big a deal is it? And the third is, does it actually matter as much as it seems to matter, given presumably a lot of people would be carrying photo ID anyway, even if they didn't know it was going to be required to pass a vote, to, to, to cast a vote? You shouldn't, I don't think, carry your passport around. But if you're lucky enough to have an Irish passport, you might have one of those little credit card ID sized things but that's that's the Irish government have issued that so would that be acceptable in an English in an English voting booth I do not know um how how big a deal do you think it's going to be is a question that I would really like to have an answer to about one million eligible voters do not currently have accepted forms of photo proof I will tell you in a moment how you can get hold of uh, a photo ID that, that will help you've got to be quick you've got to register by the 25th of April because here's another worry so far 60,368 people have applied for that since the scheme was launched so why are they doing it if there are next to no documented cases of the kind of offences that this sort of idea could be designed to address? 03456060973. And, I mean, it might be the same question in a way, or it might at least prompt the same answers. But, I mean, is there an answer to that question that doesn't just look like a very deliberate, deeply cynical, and I would say sinister attempt to, to, to reduce the number of people voting? And unless the numbers don't add up, of these million people who don't currently have photo ID, which doesn't take into account people that have it but don't carry it with them and aren't currently aware that they're going to need it on May the 4th, is there any reason to suggest that people without or to believe that people without voter ID are more likely to lean one way or the other politically? Remember that we're in an election period, so there is relatively thin ice on what we can and can't say. But I'm confident we can conduct this conversation in broad enough brush strokes to, to avoid any comment whatsoever on individual elections or, or candidates or constituencies. Is, is there any research on that? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hang on, James, that's your job. I tune in to find out stuff, not to be asked by you to go and research it. Well, today things are a bit different, all right? It's a bit like going to school and wearing home clothes or when the teacher decides to have the lesson outside under, a, under an oak tree. Is there evidence that you are more likely not to have voter ID if you lean one way or another, politically speaking? Because if there isn't, then it's not quite as sinister as it originally looked. It's going quite well. The awareness in the public has gone up from 22% to 76%. This show is now so mighty and so popular that I think we can probably nudge that needle just in the space of our time together this morning by another fraction of a percent. So <laughs> the awareness has gone up from 22% to 76%, and that's still with a month to go. So there are reasons to be optimistic. I, I guess... The reason why I've, I've I've not waded into this sooner is, and and you might not thank me for this observation. I don't like, I don't like the sinister stuff. I I, I mean I, I I found it pretty hard to say what I was thinking about Suella Braverman's racist rhetoric until Saeed Avasi sort of opened up, opened the door, or or broke the dam. I I, just, I, I don't want a Home Secretary who is herself from an ethnic minority to be deliberately pandering to the kind of voters that harbour horrible views about ethnic minorities. It just seems to me to be even worse than it would with other Home Secretaries. That's a bit of a problem of mine. I have to deal with it. But I don't want to believe the worst. You've probably noticed this over the years. And sometimes it, it leads me to tying myself in knots, bending over so far backwards that I, I, I look like I'm doing yoga. I don't want to believe the worst. I, I wanted Brexit to go better because I live here. I wanted uh, Boris Johnson to be less bad than I pretty much predicted he would be. I think I didn't go far enough in how awful he would be. Liz Truss's budget probably pushed me to breaking point. I don't know that I can sit here and say, I really hope that goes well because it was so obviously going to go badly. That would be hope in the face of absurdity. I'd be like rubbing a a lamp in the genuine hope that a genie was going to appear. I, I, I wouldn't go that far. But I don't want to believe the worst of people, of policies, or, or, or even of principles. And I don't necessarily want to believe the worst of this. But it's pretty hard not to. There are no examples, or, or, or next to no examples, of anybody abusing the system, or at least anyone being caught abusing the system. Maybe there are millions of offenders up and down the country who just haven't um, been collared yet. But why why are they doing it? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. And how worried should we be? 
And that second question, of course, opens the door to um, all sorts of variations, because how worried should we be is going to depend partly on whether or not we think that um, certain political leanings are going to be more represented among the unID'd, among the people that don't have it, and, and various other questions as well. There are 22 forms of accepted ID including passports, driving license, blue badges, and you can apply for a free voter ID certificate. I'll tell you how to do that in the next part of the problem. And from October, this is going to apply to any future general elections. You don't need it for postal votes, so don't ring me with some slightly reheated nonsense about Tower Hamlets. This has got nothing to do with postal votes, which the Electoral Commission are making some noises about with regard to couple of prominent politicians on Twitter. I'll, I'll share that with you a little later this hour as well. But why are they doing it? And how, uh, yeah, all right, how dodgy does it look from where you are? Why, why would you do this? There is no problem here. Therefore, why bring in something so far reaching and so sweeping and so significant to address a problem that doesn't really exist? The likelihood of people turning up to vote at polling stations and being turned away for having either ineligible or inadequate ID is going to be higher on May the 4th than it has ever been in your life. Just think about that, especially if, you know, you're still clinging to the carcass of Brexit and pretending that you care about democracy. The likelihood of people turning up to vote on May the 4th and being turned away because they don't have um, eligible or adequate ID is higher on May the 4th three weeks time than it has ever been in your life. How, how can anyone be happy about that? The likelihood of someone who is entitled to vote and who is in possession of everything that they would have needed to vote at the last election, the likelihood of them being turned away on May the 4th is higher than it has ever been before in your life. Why would anyone want to introduce that sort of legislation? I suppose a quick nod to balance. I, I, I maybe we're missing something. Maybe there are perfectly sensible and uninflammatory and evidence-based rationales and reasons for introducing this. I just haven't seen any, not least from the government, who seem to be keeping rather quiet about it all, which adds to the problem, doesn't it? You, you would have thought they'd be shouting from the rooftops that everyone must get their voter ID. Otherwise, otherwise mandates, arguably, are going to be compromised. Shall I hit the break on time? Would that just for a change? Would you like that? Should we do that? Yeah, I know. I, 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 well, all right. The hiatus. Oh, we've missed it. We've gone it. We've gone over by a minute. It's ten sixteen. Ninety minute, minutes after ten. Phil writes: If someone is fully committed to the heinous crime of voter fraud, a fake ID will be the least of their problems. If anything, it would make the scam easier and more credible. If anyone can work out why anyone is fraudulently voting in the first place, I'd like to know why. <clears throat> That's a very good point, picked up by Alan, who's in Cowden Beef, who says, "I've been employed in polling stations across five for years. Disenfranchising those who don't have quick, easy, and cost-free access to ID impacts the democratic process more than non-existent voter fraud, which would be, as Alan suggests, pretty." much impersonation or nothing else. So, what do you think is going on here? Elizabeth is in Birchington. Elizabeth, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Um, I'm just finding up with regard to uh, the Oyster card issue, that 60-plus Oyster cards are deemed valid, but the 18-plus Oyster card, the one with the photo on if you're a student yeah. or in work, that isn't going to be valid. Um, and I asked my MP um, if he could actually... Phone line's gone south. I would, would, I'm going to have to come back in a minute, Elizabeth. Your phone line went funny. I, do, I, I am interested in knowing what your MP had to say about this, and it is actually true. I, I, off the top of my head, I can't really think of a reason behind that, except that 18-year-olds lose their Oyster cards a lot more. But then why are you having photo ID if you're not going to check the photo against the face of the person that's standing in front of you? Peter's in Oxford. Peter, what's going on? Hello again, James. Hello, yeah, Peter. Thank you. And I, I'm very grateful to you for publicising this whole thing. It's, well, it's better late than issue. never. Better late than yeah, never, Peter. Well, so many people don't know about the, the voter ID. No. And I think that's tragic. And unfortunately, I think it will have an effect on the outcome. Um, the intentions, I think, are obvious. Uh, there's, there's a belief on the part of the government that um, voter, that, that photo ID is something that Tory voters hold more frequently than... But is that, do you think that's evidence-based? Um, I mean, I I, first is. of all, I mean, hang on, just, just, just let me say, that's a fairly hefty accusation, obviously, uh, and, and it can only be filed under suspicion or, or strong suspicion, which possibly I share. But, but I mean, it would be impossible to prove it one way or another. But if that is what they're doing, yeah. have they got 
Do you think they've got it right? I think it'll backfire on them. Go on. Um, I mean, part of it is age-based, obviously, and, you know, traditionally. Yes. The older you are, the more likely you are speaking as, some, as somebody who's of pension age. Yes. Uh, and who's never was conserved in my life and have no intention of doing so. But, I mean, there is a, there is a trend, and I think that's part of what, what is on the agenda. The, the business about oyster cards, which you pointed out, is an anomaly that really is an inexcusable. Um, but what and reason why we need to, to find out from Elizabeth what her MP said? Well, I wonder what reason you could possibly give for accepting a 60-plus oyster, oyster card, but not an 18-plus oyster card. Well, exactly. Exactly. But uh, uh, what, what I was going to say to you also is that this is only the tip of the iceberg, because the Elections Act that came in last year had three other nefarious provisions, even, even worse than the photo ID. Go on. Uh, so, so first of all, the Electoral Commission, which is now under ministerial control, and which, whose powers are more limited, and who can challenge, um, if given permission, by a minister, yeah. and clearly will challenge selectively um, electoral malpractice. And that, I think, is a really uh, unfair provision. Secondly, the business about first-past-the-post. Now, you and I know that first-past-the-post is a system that's used in the UK and Belarus and nowhere else in Europe, because, frankly, it's not fit for purpose. And they've, they've brought that in uh, for mayoral elections and, and PCP I, elections. I, I, I think, with respect, I'm going to focus in on the on the voter ID cards and save your, your, your reservations <laughs> about other elements for another day, Peter. I've got a groaning yeah. switchboard of people keen okay. to talk yeah. very specifically yeah. about the issue under discussion. So I'm going to, with your permission, Peter, I'm going to crack on with that and, and we will return to the other concerns at a later date, because, you know, the clock is ticking on the May the 4th deadline and a quarter of the country doesn't even know that they're going to need the ID. I'd add again, though, that doesn't mean they're not actually carrying it. Uh, let's just go back to Elizabeth in Birchington, whose phone line has hopefully been improved. What did your MP say when you raised the issue of 18-plus Oyster cards not being eligible, but 60-plus Oyster cards being perfectly welcome? She didn't actually say an awful lot. I've just reckoned... built up tension for this. I just treated this like a hook and tease. I can't be going back. We're crossing live to Birchington, where Elizabeth has got the very latest. And you got to talk about a damp squib. No, it's not, because he's a Tory MP. Yeah. And basically, it was just a fob off. Um, it was, he just, it was a one line response to say, um, I would imagine it's something to do with what is required to apply for one. So I went on to the TfL website. Yes. And for the 18-plus card, um, you still need um, all the address, you know, date of birth, yeah, yeah, yeah. etc. You also need a letter from the college that you go to or for the job that you are in. Um, for the 60-plus, it gives a list of things that, um, are required and then underneath that it says but if you don't have any of these you can just apply for a letter of application so but everyone can to... everyone can do that surely absolutely yeah. which is why i think to say that an 18 plus card isn't valid is absolutely ridiculous they're just trying to squeeze say, they're trying to squeeze younger voters you would you would suggest damn right damn right and it, it really really annoys me i'm trying to be polite here i'm very grateful it, <laughs> but it really, really annoys me. I'm quite a bit older than 18 plus, yes. and I do have a um, a passport and a driving license. I feel really aggrieved that I have to use it. I will do, of course, because I'm always voting. But um, I feel really aggrieved that they've brought this in, and I just think it might be the thin end of the wedge. Um, I think they might. If it doesn't go their way, I have a feeling that they might start to try and bring other forms of ID that they say, oh, that's not enough. You've got to do something else. I don't know. I, I'm not happy with it. And as I say, I just... No, I, I mean, who, what's cold water going to look like? Who can calm our fever? Who can mop our fevered brow this morning, Elizabeth? What, what would the <laughs> argument be that made us think, actually, that's not too bad? Um... What, to actually, I mean, as, as I say, for me, okay, I can supply it. I just feel sorry for other people that can't, who really want to make their statement, you yeah. know, at the ballot box, because basically that's the only way we've got at the moment to make our point known. I mean, I'm in fairly hefty correspondence with my MP, but... Um, yeah. No, Sometimes well, that, I mean, that's right, what I'm up. wondering. There may not be an answer to that question of, of, of just, you know, calm everybody down, tell us why this isn't a problem. But if you can't point to people actually being um, 
uh, a court doing this, then I don't quite know what, what the rationale would be. I see one Tory MP on Twitter claiming... Oh, he's correct to say that this is what they currently do in Northern Ireland. I don't know if there are historical or constitutional reasons for that. But he's also claiming that you need photo ID to pick up a parcel from the post office or to pick up a pepper or two. You don't. I'm, well, if you do, I've never been asked to provide voto, f- f- photo ID, proof of address maybe, or a credit card, proof of name. But I've certainly never... It's an odd thing to do as a Conservative MP, isn't it? Um, let's go to Neil, who's in South Hams in Devon. Neil, what's going on here? <laughs> Well, there's a couple of things going on. Your previous caller kind of touched on it. So to, to address the, the Oyster card thing, obviously living in Devon, it doesn't really apply to me. I'm not 60 either. So, But my understanding is to get an over 60 Oyster card, you need to provide photo ID. Yes. Um, for the for the younger person's version, I believe it's a student one, you don't. That's, that's basically the two differences. So... If okay, well, that makes sense. So, if the, so yeah. So, but it, the, the problem then is you then have a problem with uh, students not being able to vote because they can't use their Oyster card. So either you make it all or nothing. Yeah. So you make it. You have. You need photo ID to get both, or you don't use it at all. So that that's that. It's kind of simply sorted out. Um, there was 500 and something alleged cases of electoral fraud in the 2019 electoral, electoral cycle, of which resulted in four convictions. And you're right to say nobody, um, you know... But it, that it, won't you, necessarily be find. impersonation. That, that's, yeah. that's different. Yeah, exactly. That could be postal exactly. fraud or some other yeah. issue. But that's what's being held up by the right, is there's, is there's, there's so many, you know... Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let, let, let me let me let me let me read you one. Here's one, James O'Brien. I hate you. You are so anti-UK. You make me sick. I, I'll tell you in advance that this bloke's texted from a number that I've found online, linked to a business opportunity, which I may share the details of with shortly. Um, our country has been in idiots' corner. It, well, it might be worse than that. Our country has been given away. Um, uh, one million people voted for Khan to be mayor, and they were all Muslims. And 50% of them were fake votes. This will stop this rot. I tell you what, I wouldn't rent a farm off this genius. Oops, gave it away there. Didn't mean to do that. This will stop this rot. Have you been to Southall lately or Slough? Because that is how the country will be in 30 years' time. Um, America refers to us as Little India, and they have every reason to do so. Here it comes. I'm not, ace- I'm not racist, he says. I just like a clean, honest country. And unfortunately, even our prime minister can't pay his own taxes correctly. So um, that's the kind of person that this policy appeals to, by the sounds of things. Yeah, yeah exactly. But the other thing is, is that it, this is, I think it has elements of parallels with Trump and his Dominion voting machine saying they could be hacked. It's almost like having a scapegoat. We're going to lose. We know we're going to lose. We need to find something. Well, so, we don't. We don't know that. Know. I mean, I, I, I just. I think you're fine suggesting that, that you can see the writing on the wall because you're speaking very broadly about the national issue, not about any specific or local issues. But I, I mean, I, I, Trump did it after the event. I can see why you might complain about the voting system after you've lost. But to, to introduce this before, I, it's almost putting the, the cart before the horse. Twenty nine minutes after ten is the time you're listening to. James O'Brien on LBC. Thank you, Neil. I, I guess if that's true, if it's easier to get an over-18 Oyster card than it is to get an over-60 Oyster card, then that becomes less sinister, you know? And, and I mean it when I say I don't like believing the worst. It seems to me too crass to have been contemplated, even by these clowns, that they're going to say, oh, let's just stop the 18-year-olds from getting any voter. If it's, if it's much easier to get your Oyster card as a kid than it is as a pensioner, then it seems reasonable that one can be accepted as voter ID while the other one can't. I think, if I understood Neil correctly. Half past ten is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. It is 10.34. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. When, if it doesn't um, address a problem, why are they doing it? Voter ID due to kick in on May the 4th, but a quarter of people still don't know that it is going to be required to vote. Those are the figures from the Electoral Commission. Terry is in Croydon. Terry, what would you like to say? Hi. Yeah, I, I just think this is a bit of um, British or English exceptionalism here going on. Um, the rest of Europe, including the EU, and I think all the countries in Europe, all have um, a voter photo ID. But they have uh, ID cards, don't they? Compulsory ID cards. Well, I think you can use other instruments as well. Yeah, but everyone's... So this point here about a quarter of people still don't know that they have photo ID and about a million people haven't got it simply wouldn't apply in any of those countries. 
No, not now, but we at least they. We are to, we are talking. Of, we're talking about now. We can't compare apples with pears, Terry. No, I won't be doing that. The, so you can't compare a country that doesn't have compulsory ID cards with a country that does. You can use an ID card in France to travel everywhere within the Schengen uh, section, can't you? It's why the kids aren't coming here right. on their school trips but why, anymore. Why do Europe do that and we don't? That's the question. ID card. The, no, but why do they do that? We, we, historically, have... we've had a, 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 an objection to ID cards because it makes people think of being asked for their papers in the final scenes of The Great Escape. Yeah, well, but that's exceptionalism by it's, it's British exceptionalism. No, but it's not, there. is it? Okay. The, the, the next, so the the next here's point. the question that, that we're doing on the phone in today. Why do you think the government are bringing it in if there are next to no documented cases of the problem that it would ostensibly be designed to solve? Because the fact that there's not next to or there are documented cases, and the fact there's next to none doesn't mean like we can. I can find document. one from the last ten years. Right. How many cases? No, you can't answer a question with a question. GM, Why do you I think can. they're bringing it in? I think that there's concern yeah. that there is there is a problem. And what's the evidence and for that problem? When, well, the evidence that I've got yeah. is that when Ireland um, took up, uh, it was in 2002, I think. You're talking about they, another country again. What's the evidence here? Northern Ireland. What's the evidence here Northern, in Great Britain, Northern where Ireland. it's being introduced in England this, on May the 4th? What's the evidence? Part, Northern Ireland is part of the UK, and they brought in... Yeah, we've um, already we've Exeter already checks. covered that. So where's the no, evidence no, of fraud? He, we have. Before. I mentioned it five minutes ago, Terry. Where's the evidence before. of fraud in this country? Well, in the cases that have been mentioned, there are cases. Go on then. I've, I've seen people do it. You've lived in a shared house. You know those cards come through the door. Yeah. And unless someone's in that queue, did you report? Neighbor, did you report the people to... that, did, that you saw doing it? No. Why not? Did you Did you see it? I've never witnessed it. I don't think it happens. Who, why would anyone want to go and vote with a false name? What's the point? Well, people do. People get political. But what did you do when you witnessed it, though? What did you do? Uh, well, I was quite young at the time. How old now, were you? How old were you? I'd have been 30s. Well, in your 30s? Yeah. And you witnessed electoral fraud? Yeah. And you did I nothing mean, about I, I it? Didn't, yeah, I didn't. But you I care enough about it to ring a national radio station and tell porky pies? You mean a porcupine? You didn't witness way. it at all, and if you did, then you're complicit in the crime. Well, then the crime does exist. Do you admit that, then? No, 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 mate, I think you're lying. I'm not lying. Prove that's, it. That's outrageous. Prove it. An outrageous that's okay. accusation. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm, I, until you've got something a little bit better than uh, Europe, Ireland, and I witnessed it in my 30s, you're going to sound uh, a little Ireland. bit ridiculous. So, final question: What's the evidence? What's the evidence for the problem, Terry? Apart from the thing that you saw, uh, so you you have found some evidence of voter fraud, but it goes to a different school. What? Tim's in crew. Tim, what would you like to say? Um, good morning, James. Hello, uh, love the show, but I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one. Well, uh, well it didn't go well for the last bloke, Tim. But fill your boots. <laughs> no. Uh, so I heard. Be be uh, be gentle with me. I just think there's a. I just think there's a drive for using official ID more in all sorts of uh, everyday life now. I just picked you up on a point you made earlier. Yeah. I picked up a parcel from the post office and I had to produce photo ID. So that is a thing there as well. But I, I, I picked it. up a parcel from a post office and not had to produce photo ID. So I mean, I, I don't know that that's relevant to anything really. No. Well, well, what I'm saying is the card that I had through the door mm. said to bring photo ID. Oh, fair enough. But that would be theft. So, so that's designed to stop you from stealing. And, and I can see why if someone put a card through my door, I might think to myself, oh, this is like playing, um, what's that Noel Edmonds game show with all the boxes? This is like, this is like playing that game. I'm going to go and deal or no deal. I'm going to go down the post office, hand over the card and get given a sort of mystery box, which I can then yes, open. Well, and it might, yes, I can yes. see why I'd do that. But why would I go and vote pretending to be you? Uh, I don't know why you pretend to be me at all, to be honest. <laughs> I um, don't know why anyone would pretend to be me either, but this is the crime that we are allegedly addressing, and, and I can't see any evidence that it exists. It's always... I, I, I was surprised that there's so little um, voter crime, as you described it, but it's, I must admit, it's always struck me as strange that whenever I've gone along to vote, mm. I don't have to prove who I am. And that I it's too easy. To... It's always struck you as too easy to vote. 
No, I've always thought it's strange that I don't yeah. have to prove who I I don't even have to take the, the polling card. No, just your name and address. Up. Just your name and address and they give it to you. See, I agree with you about that. I've, I've always felt that was a little odd as well. But the more I think about it, the more it should, the easier it should be to vote. That, that there's a real tension here, almost a philosophical tension, between the idea of democracy being enhanced by the ease with which you can cast your vote, but then you can trump that or you can at least counterbalance that by arguing that the easier it is to vote, the easier it is to impersonate or personate, which I'm told is the correct word, personate someone else, which is why you then you have to look to the evidence, don't you? Because if you're going to put on one side of the scales, the easier it is to vote, the stronger your democracy is, the more representative it is, the more people are represented. But on the other side, you say the easier it is to vote, the easier it is to commit fraud. In order to decide which side of the scales prevails, you've got to look at the evidence, no? Okay, so having to produce one of these um, official uh, pieces of ID, yeah. who, who who would that be excluding then? Well, one million uh, people at the moment. That haven't got. Mm. But uh, according to the, the voting card that I'm looking at, you can apply to... Uh, vote online, can't you? You, you? I don't know if you... I presume you can apply to vote online or you can apply for a document that would allow you to vote, but only 60,368 people have done that. It might be cock-up rather than conspiracy, Tim. They might have brought it in for reasons that aren't sinister, but they're not bringing it in effectively enough to address the concerns that people are airing this morning. Well, I've, I've had this card in my flat now for two weeks, so, you know, and I've read it and I've, I've got photo ID... Well, if I hadn't got photo ID, I've been given plenty of warning yeah. of, of counter steps to take, i.e. But I just keep saying online. a million people back to you. I say a quarter of people still do not know that photo ID is required to vote in the upcoming election. So, I, I mean, I'm like you. I know everybody listening to this programme, as of this morning, knows, even if they didn't know before. But if this figure is correct and it comes from the Electoral Commission, a quarter right. of people still don't know, which is why I'm asking the question, really. You could even phrase it like this. If a quarter of a million people don't know about this, why the hell are they still going ahead with it? Because it's failed as a communications project, hasn't it? Well, how long have we got now before the election? Three weeks? Yeah. Well, well, well again, I come back to the poll, poll card. Doesn't everybody in the country get one well, of them? When I or... come back to the court of a million people, don't know that photo ID is required. Because you might know that you've got your polling card. You might have pinned it to the notice board in the kitchen like you have at every other election you've been alive for, with the intention of taking it down to the polling booth on election day and casting your vote. You haven't read it. Hey, let's be frank, Tim. It's... it's... It's a fairly odd thing to do, to read to read the, the polling card from, from beginning. It's like reading cereal boxes. Most people aren't going to be doing that. But if, if they had, they would have discovered it. A quarter of people, not a quarter of a million people, a quarter of eligible voters haven't done it. I understand your point. And as far as reading the card, it's not a matter of turning it over and reading it. It's, it's in big letters right at the top <laughs> on the front. We could do this all day. A quarter of people don't know. So it doesn't matter whether the letters are, are like a millimetre high or 100 feet high. A quarter of people don't know. The message hasn't reached them, which is, I suppose, a slight shift in the original question this morning from why are they doing this full stop, well, question mark, to why are they doing this despite the fact that the communications have failed so badly that a quarter of people still don't know that it's going on. But I, I, I take your point. I really do. That the idea of not wanting to believe the worst it could just be they've brought it in for unsinister reasons they haven't really done their homework properly uh, a quarter of people uh, eligible to vote haven't really got the message one million eligible voters are thought not to currently have um, any forms of photo proof so they, they need to go back to the drawing board and not leave this in place for may the 4th and of course some people are pointing out not tongue-in-cheek tim that not everyone can read you know um Robbie's in Barnes. Robbie, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Good morning. Um, well, I used to agree that it should be easy to vote, but um, I changed my mind at the last election. I went in with my polling card, and they said, you've already voted. I said, <gasps> no, I haven't. I Good said, grief. They said, yes, it's you. you. It's you. This is you. This is all, <laughs> this is all your fault. It's def- it was definitely my fault, yes. And they said, look, there's a big black line through your, your name and address. And I said, but... But I literally haven't voted. Honestly, I haven't voted. And they said, no, the black line's there. What did they um, do? Is it, I mean, is that just they can't do anything about it? 
nothing. That's, this is what really surprised me the most. There's nothing like, well, like that, that, the that, boss man. Though. That would be the more interesting number, wouldn't it, than actual convictions or actual prosecutions, how often that happens. But there's no guarantee that was nefarious. I'm I agree, always... I agree, yeah. I thought, this is just a cock-up that someone just yeah. put the black line through my name. Or, or you live on like, Acacia was... Avenue and someone with the same name lives on, lives yeah. on Acacia Road or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it could easily have been that, but it was quite a close vote. It's the, it was the, like a okay. Richmond... Yeah, you can say uh, that retrospectively, but, can't you? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah but <laughs> I, I felt a bit powerless because there's nothing... They said, the boxman said there's nothing we can do and I kind of went away with a flea in my ear. And no votes. So yeah, I get it. that. I think I would feel aggrieved if that had happened to me. Unless your name is something like Rastapopoulos Gibbons, there's always going to be a slight risk of, of, of duplication or just a bit of dodderiness on the part of the people putting the line through the ruler. Or someone did turn up and, and impersonate you, Robbie, for reasons that are yeah. fairly hard to pin down at this point in proceedings. And I, I just don't know which it was. But I agree with you. It could just, just easily be a cock-up. What, and, and has that experience given you... A conviction that this is a good idea. Yeah, yes, it, it has. Now, so I came back and said to my, my wife, voted and she, she got through and she voted and fine. I said, you know, I think there should be some kind of ID check. I, I'm not sure about a photo, but I thought this. Yeah, now, now I do think there should be a, an ID check. Something. There's a few people suggesting you deserve a Ray Liotta for this for this experience. <laughs> I believe you, by the way. I didn't believe the other fella because he wasn't telling us the truth. How would you know that someone was is standing in the booth and Robbie says, "I'm Robbie from Barnes. Can I cast my vote, please?" And, and someone else goes, no, you're not. You're not Robbie from... How dare you? How would you know that someone else was doing it? What a prune. Uh, not you, Robbie. Terry. Um, it's the vote of fraud Ray Liotta, says Steve. I can't start giving him out for that sort of thing. It is 10.50. James says Bernard. I don't know why I pronounce it like that. Perhaps you're just a Bernard, but I, I like the sound of Bernard. Uh, Bernard in Newcastle says, I have a postal vote. The only identifier is my signature. No f type of photo ID at all. Isn't that odd? Yes, because it means all you've got to do is live at the address that you say that you live at. And quite a few people pointing out that, um, uh, uh, what was the name of that nice chap in Barnes a moment ago? But it, that, that experience, but he did acknowledge that it could have just been a cock up. He said it three or four times, but I can see why it might harden your resolve that ID cards are a good idea. I like this from Richard, who's in Ashby de la Zouche. He says, I refuse to carry ID which always sounds a bit pompous, as he acknowledges a little later in the, in the text. He says, I refuse to carry ID, so I, I get why. It always makes me think of Donald Pleasance in the, in the final scenes of The Great Escape. Is it Donald Pleasant? It's not, is it? It's, it's Gordon Jackson. Uh, the German says, have a good trip, in English. And he goes, thank you very much. Oh, rats, I've just given myself away to the Nazis. I refuse to carry ID, so my wife and I will carry each other's ID to the polling station and then swap them over in there. Petty? Oh, yes. Keep up the good work. I, there's a bit of celebratory pettiness. Um, and Colin says, this is an excellent discussion. I can't get my head around how it would be possible to defraud an election. The only thing I can think of is someone who owns many properties in the same area with no tenants, who hasn't updated the council with their permanent address and gets sent a bunch of voter cards that aren't theirs. Surely there aren't many of these. And they'd definitely be a certain political demographic. It, uh, yeah, and then from the other side of the coin, Pete in Froome says, the only reason to bring this in is to disenfranchise left-wing voters. That's certainly a fear that I've seen. All the evidence I've seen, writes Pete, shows that uh, those without photo ID are far more likely to be younger uh, uh, or from ethnic minorities and therefore more likely to vote against the Tories. They've tried this in multiple states in the US during Trump times. Funnily enough, it's never the left that tries to bring in these rules. I, I think you're probably right, actually. 10.52 is the time. Brad is in Liverpool. Brad, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Big fan, mate. Uh, Thank you, Brad. So... I'm an employment advisor, and I've actually currently switched jobs. But um, did you take your I'm own advice? Before, did you take your own advice before you did that? <laughs> yeah, I, I sure did. Um, but I worked in a office that basically had a thousand customers, well participants we call them, and I'd say sixty-five percent had no photo ID, mm. and that is very similar across the country. Um, I now work for a company who have nationwide contracts and I deal with people in London and it's the same story. Um, I think it's basically the Tories basically trying to stop people being eligible to vote and it's, it's election tampering. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, as, 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 as we all appreciate, that is, a, that is a fairly hefty accusation and it can only really be refuted, I would have thought, with, with evidence, wouldn't it? It's, 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 well, it's, I mean, I, 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 I mean it when I say I don't like to believe the worst. So I don't, I don't, I can't, 
people are going to laugh at me now, including you probably, Brad. I just can't imagine them all sitting around a table and coming up with something that would be so transparent if your analysis is correct. But well, I, I, think, I think that the back catalogue of what they've tried to get away with in the past is evident enough, to be honest. Mm. Um, it, it, it's a very simple technique for them to actually get what they want. Because when you think about it, if you take, say, a 1,000 people as a representative of the population yeah. and 65% haven't got photo ID, and if they want to pick up seats where they think that they, they can... And that, that, that's where the disproportionate the representation... I mean, the figure's not that high among the population in general. The estimate is a total of a million people who don't have it. A quarter of the mm. electorate don't know that they need it. But an awful lot of people who don't know that they need it are going to be carrying it anyway. But usually in the form of a, of a driving licence or, or an over-60s travel card of some sort. And, and various other. There are 22 things. But no, I take your point. I'm, I'm probably slightly more worried about this than I was at 10 o'clock this morning, and I was pretty worried at 10 o'clock. Who do you think said this? I, I shall read you a quote. Ready for this? If I am ever asked on the streets of London or in any other venue, public or private, to produce my ID card as evidence that I am who I say I am when I have done nothing wrong and when I am simply ambling along and breathing God's fresh air like any other free-born Englishman, then I will take that card out of my wallet and physically eat it in the presence of whatever emanation of the state has demanded that I produce it. I don't know if Rich, uh, Richard in Ashby de la Zouche is going to be pleased to find himself in the same company as this character, but who, who do you think it was that said that? I, I, I may remember to tell you later, but I probably won't. Tree's in Bristol. Tree, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, I mean, like, at the end of the day, it's voter wow. suppression, isn't it? I mean, like, at the end of the day. Are you some sort of football player giving a post-match yeah. interview? This is outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Hey, we all love our football, don't we? We do. Come on. It's a game of two halves. Yeah, exactly. What, what is it, though? I mean, you'd need to be, I mean, conf is, you'd need to be confident that people who lean one way or another politically are going okay, to be so, overrepresented in these categories. Yeah, so like, let's look at the evidence. There's no evidence of, like, the evidence of voter fraud is so minuscule, right? Yeah. The, the, the Conservatives are making it a, 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 an issue, just like the GOP did in the United States. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a page out of their playbook, isn't it? Well, possibly, so, except that was largely done after elections, wasn't it? Well, right? yes. Yeah. But, but like, so you, you imagine, uh, you, you think, like you said, you said democracy should be more accessible. I think so. So they're, they're, they're eliminating a, a certain subsection of the, the population, well, younger voters, for example. And who yeah. are they more likely to vote for? Yeah, okay. probably more who, likely to, to yeah. lean to the left and to the right. And I mean, exactly. I, and my defence sounds increasingly pathetic with every caller that raises this point. And I say, but it's so obviously rubbish. How could anyone possibly have contemplated it? But this is the people that brought us Brexit and Liz Truss. Yeah, so the exactly. idea that they're not going to do something just because it's rubbish and transparently awful doesn't really carry anyone. <laughs> it doesn't but, really but pass imagine, muster. Imagine the, yeah, the organised collective to try and do what voter fraud do? like you're talking about you're talking about the Labour Party how organised are they mm. you know they're not at all <laughs> I mean, no. like it's just, so it's going it's after it, 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 our friend in Barnes really these tiny yeah. numbers of examples of people who've had their name crossed out on the sheet quite possibly by mistake but who do feel disenfranchised as a result and I have sympathy for that position albeit that it hasn't really happened to a, 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 a notable number of people you, you, you can understand why that might create a desire to see a car but for me that concern is outweighed by the bigger issues that you cite, I mean, it does just look a little bit, um, a little bit rum. I would say that is all that I would say, particularly when you factor in concerns from the Electoral Commission that um, that it can be delivered well. Uh, that's what they are focused on. But there's a warning from the local government association that election staff could be overwhelmed dealing with the new rules. It's a bit like Dover, isn't it? Ah, there you go. I was wondering how I could bring Brexit into this. It's a bit like Dover in microcosm. So the queues are going to be much longer now, aren't they? So previously, you could just flash your passport. If you're on a school trip, you didn't even barely need to do that. Straight through customs, into France. Jobs are good and you'll be at Mont Saint-Michel by tea time or up the Eiffel, up the Eiffel Tower. Now, you're going to have to produce photo ID and, and they're going to have to check it like that, looking at your face going, oh, hang on a minute, have you grown a beard? Have you, oh, you've changed your hair a bit. So you're probably going to add a few seconds to every encounter, which means the queues coming out the back of the booth, out the back of the polling booth are going to get longer. I don't know. Penny's in Wad Waddesdon. Penny, what would you like to say? Um, well, we all have polling cars, James. We do. Um, and uh, everybody in the household must have one. I've never been asked for it when I go and vote. Um, why can't we just take our polling cards and hand them in? Because yeah, um, you the could be personate. You could be Penny the personator. You well, could no, because there's only one card for me. Yeah, but you might. It might have been sent to the people that lived in the house before you did. 
Um, well, that's a possibility, but um, we all have to update our electoral roll once a year, I believe, which I've done this year, so yeah. our names in this house would be correct. But the fraud is going to be committed by people who, are, who haven't done that. Well, that, I agree that, with you that I yeah. don't think there is a lot of fraud. I think that what you've done as the final call of the hour is bring the if it ain't broke, don't fix it argument well, yes, to the but table. Just tell us to take us the card. Yeah. Um, and they could keep them in alphabetical order for the um, gentleman that um, couldn't vote that day. Yes. Um, if they kept them in alphabetical order, they could quickly check, couldn't they? That's how I, I would. I, do I, it. Well, yeah, I mean, I would. All of these issues raise the question of why they're doing what they're doing. Correct. Don't they? And I agree with you. Um, and nothing the government done that, uh, does on communication has, in my life and experience, um, particularly things that have happened to me, um, been very effective. No, I hear you. It's the first anniversary of the Rwanda policy today. That's going well, isn't it? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> 11 o'clock. Is, it's true, that, by the way. I didn't make that up. It's the first anniversary of the Rwanda policy. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you who said that. So uh, if, if I, I'll, th- I'll do the voice. If I am ever asked on the streets of London or in any other venue, public or private, to produce my ID card as evidence that I am who I say, I am when I have done nothing wrong and when I am simply ambling along and breathing God's fresh air like any other freeborn Englishman, then I will take that card. Is Boris Johnson, who you'd expect to be speaking out against uh, uh, this ID card business that he so passionately railed against at some point previously. But to be fair to Boris Johnson, he's very busy at the moment, working in a food bank, supporting the striking nurses, um, uh, dealing with lots of local community issues. Is, uh, you know, it's, uh, you say what you like about the man. He works very hard on the behalf of voters. Four minutes after 11. This is probably the first time ever that we've conducted two phone-ins about two issues that are going to be three days apart. So we just did the election. That is on May the 4th, isn't it? Is that what we said? May the 4th. That's Star Wars Day, isn't it? It's inter- International Star Wars Day. Um, but also, uh, the guess what's happening on May the 6th? That, that can't be right, can it? It's happening on a Saturday. I know what you're thinking. This is the kind of internal dialogue I should probably have off air, isn't it, rather than on air. But too late now. So what do you think is happening on May the 6th? This is a, this is a, this is a, a, a throbbing hub of news, the room from which I currently speak. We, we actually just had to check. So how many people are shouting at the radio on this one? What's happening on May the 6th? Is everyone clear about what's happening on May the 6th? Elections on May the 4th in England. What's happening two days later? Thursday, May the 4th. Saturday, May... Anyone? Anyone? Keith's got a DJ gig. Uh, that's not it, mate. Anyone else? Yeah, it's the coronation. It's the, the, the king's coronation. Now, I have had a question bubbling away in the back of my mind for a few weeks. But when it first appeared in the back of my mind, I felt it was too soon to ask the question, and that the answers to the question may change as the, as the date approached, as, as, it, as it got nearer. Um, so local elections in England, 4th of May, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, 18th of May. But Northern Ireland, of course, is not relevant to the conversation we had about ID cards because they are already required there. So I started wondering about three months ago, probably, whether or not the coronation was going to be unique in our lifetimes as an absolutely massive royal event about which most people didn't really care. And I, and I say this not as an ardent Republican or a, or a tireless enemy of monarchy. I say this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an observer of British society. That is, as I get older, I find myself intrigued more and more by what other people think and do than I am obsessed with laying out my own opinions and pungent takes on the issues of the moment. You may find that somewhat hard to believe if you tune into this programme on a regular basis, but trust me, if you'd been tuning in 10 years ago, you'd, you'd have heard a very... Di- I'm, I'm generally and genuinely more interested in watching than joining in as I, as I get older. And... There are two reasons why I haven't asked you this question before. The first I've just explained is that I wondered whether levels of excitement and interest would increase as the day loomed ever closer. And the second was just a little bit of discomfort. Now, I don't know whether I've been bullied into this by sort of public, whatever you'd call it, whether the idea of offering up... The thing is, if you can be accused of hating your own country 
because you keep pointing out how bloody stupid Brexit was, then it seems to me fairly clear that you could be accused of hating your own country if you wonder out loud uh, about some elements, even perhaps up to and including the very existence of the monarchy. And I, and I find that quite tiring. I find all these idiots talking about how other people hate the country while they keep voting for saboteurs and arsonists to run the place and inflicting ludicrous uh, self-harming policies upon the entire population. The people who really love our country are the ones who took away your freedom of movement. The people who really love our country are the ones defending gollywogs in Essex pubs. The ones who really love our country uh, are the ones that turned us into the first population in the history of humanity to impose economic sanctions on itself. Yeah, the people who point out why all of this is unnecessary and unpleasant, they're the real traitors. They've done it to Joe Biden today. They're accusing Joe Biden of hating Britain. Who exactly are we going to end up trading with, do you think? By the time this lot are finished, alienating absolutely everybody with whom we have any relationship whatsoever. We're already massively weakened when it comes to international trade. You're, you're part of the biggest trading bloc on the planet and you're looking to sign some sort of deal with America. Do you, who do you think is going to get treated better? The United Kingdom or the biggest single market on the planet? Exactly. But that's what happens when you trust Nigel Farage instead of Barack Obama on a post-Brexit UK-US trading prospect. So uh, they're doing it to Joe Biden now. Joe Biden says, I think the Brits could probably do a little bit more to get Stormont back up and running, i.e. the British government could exercise influence over its allies in the DUP, to whom they gave £1 billion about 10 minutes ago, uh, perhaps to, to get democracy back on its feet in Northern Ireland, the government in Westminster could do a little bit more. Because at the moment, for all the success and, and welcome of the so-called Windsor framework, they've still not gone back to Stormont. That's not even controversial. That's not even an opinion. It's just counting. If the UK government, whoever it is, Conservative, Labour or raving loonies, if they can't bring a little bit of pressure to bear upon the DUP to get back into Stormont, then who can? Answer nobody. So Joe Biden says that. He gets accused of hating Hating Britain. He hates Britain. It's, it's just mad now. The stuff that would once have been confined to weirdos on Twitter and the inbox on a radio phone-in show, it's now government policy practically. He hates Britain. He hates Britain. So that's why perhaps I'm a little bit reluctant to have full and frank conversations about the royal family. I think it has more to do with the late Queen. I, I, I think as she got older and achieved a... A, a, a status that we'll never see again. She, she achieved a, a quasi-mythical status, I think, the late Queen. And listen, just because she didn't achieve a quasi-mythical status with you doesn't mean she didn't achieve a quasi-mythical status. That's a bit like believing there's no such thing as a common cold because you've never caught it. I, I think the Queen did achieve a quasi-mythical status. Or, or, or medieval, if you prefer. The way that enormous queue was deliberately orchestrated to create a kind of medieval sense of pro progress or... Um, or pilgrimage even, it, it, it worked. It worked really well. A lot of people were deeply, deeply moved by it. Even before David Beckham turned up and queued like um, everybody else except mid-morning television presenters, that, 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 that was deliberate. There was a mythical air to monarchy when the late Queen was on the throne, whether you like it or not, OK? And, and I'm not sure how helpful it is in the great scheme of things. I do believe, as I get older, that the entrenched inequality in this country, the deference, the forelock tugging, the cap doffing, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, I don't think you can ever really start remedying that as, as long as you've got sort of um, uh, monarchs and princes and princesses running around the place. But the coronation on the 6th of May is not about the late Queen. So it's not a conversation that you are rendered reluctant to have by respect, if you like, or affection for the late Queen. You, you, you can have a conversation about the coronation and whether or not it is all a little bit ridiculous. Or, And I'm going to share some polling with you in a moment, which is the second reason why I've decided to talk about this today. Um, without running foul or running risk of sounding as if you're disrespecting the late queen now for the record if you wanted to disrespect the late queen i would defend your right to do so to the death while not well not to the death i mean don't be silly but i wouldn't have necessarily agreed with you it's just a freedom of speech issue and by freedom of speech i mean freedom of speech not freedom of speech which is what racists talk about when they're demanding the right to be racist in public but this feels very very different to me what do you think the most pro-royal demographic is, age-wise? Yeah, obviously, it's the over-65s. 
The, even among the over 65s, according to YouGov today, 53% said they did not care very much or at all about the coronation. So the whole country is going to grind to a halt. We've got an extra bank holiday on the following Monday. I haven't currently got in front of me the amount of money that it is going to cost, but it will be fairly hefty. And it has seemed to me for some time that a significant majority of the country couldn't give a fig, a much, much, much higher proportion of the population that would have been similarly ambivalent about... Uh, a, a, um, a, a jubilee. I don't want to say a funeral because I think that 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 doesn't sound right. But a, but a jubilee or a big celebration or a birthday. The Queen's birthday that was a massive one, wasn't it? The birthdays, jubilees, all that. I mean, a coronation is the biggest one of all. The coronation is the mothership. Thirteen minutes after eleven is the time, and coronation apathy is particularly high among younger age groups. 75% of people aged between 18 and 24 do not care very much or at all. I've checked with Ofcom. The phrase I want to use during this part of the programme is not permissible. I wanted to do a phone-in that would say to you, does anybody really give a shiny something about the coronation? But that would be both inappropriate and indeed in... But it's just... It's, that's, that's, it's, just it's a bit more visceral. It feels a bit more human than mere YouGov polling. But YouGov polling is all that we have. And it shows 75% of people aged between 18 and 24 do not care very much or at all about the event. Take it up a notch to 60 to 25 and 49, you've got 69% of the population either don't care at all or don't care very much. So the, the statistics suggest that the coronation is not exciting people on anything like the scale that previously massive episodes of royal pageantry have excited people. And I think, I think it's worth asking why, 03456060973. But the people I'm most interested in talking to, as always really on the programme, are the people who are slightly surprised by their own position. So you've always loved a bit of pageantry. You may have even headed down to the mall with your... Uh, with your flags and your, and your and your little face face, you know your masks, not the COVID masks, the masks that make you look like a member of the royal family. You, you you've always been quite excited about. It's, by the way, I'm not confining the conversation to people in this category. I just think at first glance that you're going to be the most interesting people to talk to. You've always been a bit of a bit of a one for a bit of pageantry. Love a bit of pageantry. Get yourself down the mail for the Queen's birthday. Brian May up on top of the palace, giving it large on his guitar. Oh, oh, I love it. I love it. Giving a wave at the carriage, and and this one, which is imminent now, three weeks tomorrow. Mm, you're just a little bit meh. I'd like you to tell me why. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Um, but for everybody else who who wasn't previously caught up in the pageantry, I've been to a couple of things. But again, I'm leaving the funeral out of it because I think that's it's distasteful to bring the funeral into it in a sort of league table of things that we care about. I, I, I think we, the funeral touched many people who weren't expecting to be quite as touched as they were, myself included. So please let me be in charge of that decision. We'll leave the funeral out of it. But everything else, birthdays, troopings of the colour, jubilees, celebrations, all the royal stuff. Weddings, weddings are the big one, aren't they? Weddings, royal wedding, we love a royal wedding. Oh, I love a royal wedding. Um, but this one's leaving you cold. I want the why of it, 03456060973. But I also want to have a slightly more sophisticated conversation about what this might mean. Because if a significant swathe of the population is largely ambivalent about the coronation of a new king. Well, you have to wonder what that says about the future for monarchy, don't you? So feel free to answer that question as well. If a significant swathe of the population is ambivalent about the coronation of a new king, what do you think that says? This might be something you've been thinking about already, actually. What, what, what does the population, what does the people's relationship with monarchy, what happens to it after the most remarkable monarch, is replaced. I've got no beef with Charles, actually. As, as he's got older, I, I mean, look, the petulant throwing of the pen and stuff like that. But I think he's, I think he's a fairly good egg 
for, for you know, all, all the things you could end up being as a child of such enormous privilege. And, and, and to, well, just look at his brother. But I, I've got no beef with Charles as a human being. The, the concept of monarchy changes according to who's on the throne, I think. And I just wonder what this says to you. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. 17 minutes after 11 is the time. Should, do you want a quick visit to Idiot's Corner before we go to the, to the nudge? Here's, here's one. I, I, again, I can't tell whether this is coming in because someone's desperate to get into Idiot's Corner, but I'll read it out anyway because it made me smile. I think this radio station is so right-wing, it's just not worth listening to. Goodbye. To which I say goodbye. It is 18 minutes after 11. What, what, where, where are you on the coronation? Are you surprised by how little you care? And what does the absence of enthusiasm among the population at large say to the future of the monarchy or, or the role of monarchy in modern Britain? Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 21 minutes after 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Where... What would you call it? Like concerns about the coronation? Because I've just got a feeling... Well, well, let's find out. Dave's in Rutland to kick things off. Dave, I, I, I'm not going to say the question again because I'm not even quite sure that I can, but you got the gist of what I was saying. What's your response to it? Yeah, morning, James. Um, I was... Um, I, I never really thought about it until I heard it on the radio, really. Yeah. And uh, it, got me, it got me thinking about... Well, am I going to am I going to sit down and watch it? Am I going to make a a point of trying to you know make sure I get every last sort of snippet and detail of what's going on? And I'm not really not not really uh, not really um, cross my mind to, to sit and watch it. What however, we, go on. I was going to say, however, you know, with things involving the Queen in the past, yeah, it would be something that I'd I'd make a point of doing. Yes. I think I think you're every man on this. I think you're going to be speaking for a, a huge number of people, especially with the little bit that you hadn't actually stopped to think about it until we started talking about it on the radio, which fits with the not really being that bothered about it. Yeah, all. exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's going to be a nice weird. Bank holiday. It, well, yeah, no one, no one touched the bank holiday. We're all pleased. About, well, most of us <laughs> are pleased about that. But it's a bit odd, isn't it? No one ever thought, apart from fairly well versed Republicans. No one would ever really say, why on earth are we bringing the country to a standstill? And there'll be nothing else on telly, except probably friends on more four. But, but why on earth are we bringing the country to a standstill for something that so few people care about? Because with the late Queen, it was obvious that millions and millions and millions of people did care about it. Um, I, yeah, that's uh, that's the, uh, uh, the sort of the thought process that I've, I've been through since you, since you started talking about it, yeah. really. And um, it, it just... I mean, from my perspective, I was, I was um, the one of the feelings that I had about you know about watching uh, yeah watching it is it's almost still like there's a, there's still almost a, a quite a big hole left by yeah. where the Queen was and 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 her status as the monarch and how she has been for well all of my life. Well, that's easily. the point. I think because practically everybody was uh, only had one monarch for the duration of their lives. Uh, you know that that's going to apply to pretty much everybody, or, or give or take, and and th that means you never really questioned it. But now you've got a new fella coming in, it, it it's a very different. It feels very different, and and the why is a lot closer to the surface than it ever was with the late queen. Why are we doing? And and I worry a bit. I know they're supposed to be having a scaled down version, but it's still going to be pretty fancy. That you watch the pageantry and the golden hats and the carriages and the and. It, I, I, I don't know. I don't want it to look ridiculous, but I do the wonder other, whether it's going to look a bit ridiculous for younger viewers. And the, the other thing is, as well, as well, is because of because the Queen was the monarch for so long. We've 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 already seen so much of Prince Charles as the Prince of Wales. Yes, you know he was much more. He was much more in the in the eye of the media, and much more sort of. Not quite accessible, but you get what I'm... You get no, I do. You're not going to be tuning in to find out a bit more. Let's see what he's like, because, you know, we don't know that much we about know who him. who he is, yeah. We shall see. I mean, it may be that on the day we all get caught up in the moment once again and to tune in and turn out, but I don't know. It just it, it, It's the figures in the survey tallying so completely with my thoughts and suspicions that have prompted this conversation. And Dave is not alone. Hearing that introduction for me is the light bulb moment, or as Grant describes it, the slap around the chops moment. He says, oh, that's harsh. That's a slap around the chops. Uh, the the realisation that I'm not in the first group, nor even the second group called out. I must be getting old and grumpy. So the first group would be um, uh, that, that don't care about it at all. And the second group would be don't care about it very much. I think the coronation is a ridiculous waste of money. 
but then probably not as much as our Prime Minister writes off for their friends. Is that apathy, James? No, I don't think so. I care, but not as much as I detest our current government and system, says Grant. I, I think Charles's triumph is to detach himself from the sense of the, 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 the for want of a better word, the establishment, and, and to be a sort of monarch who says things that are sometimes challenging, sometimes unexpected. Uh, you know, that idea of him being proven right by posterity about issues like the environment and even architecture, even talking to plants, who he used to be portrayed as a, very, as a borderline ridiculous figure, and that, that has been overcome, but not enough to prompt the majority of the population to care about his coronation. Uh, Steve's in Manchester. Steve, what do you reckon? Um, so I don't, I don't believe the polls, uh, and I'll tell you why. So I can take or leave the royal family more or less throughout the year. Yeah. Um, with that said, uh, if somebody said tomorrow we'd take the royal family away, I, I'd oppose that because I'd rather have them than not. Sure. Um, and if they bring in money in more than the cost in, I'm happy with that. And then I move on with my own life. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that being said... If so you, you haven't got any crockery then? I don't have any crockery just yet. <laughs> but with that said, it may change, and, and this is where I'm coming on to. Go on. As the build-up starts to happen, whether it be a wedding, whether it be the funeral... Uh, whether it be this coronation that's the first thing that's happened, happened in my lifetime. Mm. Um, if, you, if you'd have done that poll probably a month ago to me, and I said, whatever, I'm not interested. Okay. And so what I'm trying to say is that even if you ask me today, I'd probably say, yeah, I, I might even look at it. I know what's going to happen. I'll do what I always do. As the build starts to build, I'll start to talk to my kids about it. And then on the day, I'll say, go on, we'll switch it on. And we'll probably have a few little flags going on because I do it for the kids, not me, obviously. Sure. Yeah, obviously. And then on the day, I'll be watching that and you'll not get me away from the telly and I'll have goosebumps and I'll be proud of what we do and I'll think the world is watching this, we should be proud of what we mm. got. And that's the cycle that happens. So I think the polls probably don't reflect that and a lot of people are probably in the same shoes as me. That's why I waited, well, I partly waited because the poll dropped very conveniently today, but we're three weeks and a day out. Yeah, I, I would have expected that process to be underway by now. What process? Sorry, the, the process of enthusement, if that's something I've just invented a word. I, I don't know. I think I think it can be very last minute. If, if you meet anyway, it's pretty last minute. Always. Yeah. Even so, for the weddings. I mean, the build up to the weddings, mate, it seemed to go on for years. Yeah. Even the little true. ones. Even 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 the the Andrew and his wife. Uh, I, I, I agree. It'd be interesting to do a poll... On the day. On the day or the day after. Just say, all right, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah? No, OK, I think you probably speak for a lot of people, but it doesn't refute the polls, because, you know, if you've got 60... Well, depending on what age group you're in, if you've got 53, you're younger than that, you've got 69% saying that they don't care very much or at all. That's 31%, right, minus the don't knows who do care. So, you, you know, it's not saying that nobody cares at all, but I think we can all probably agree that this is a very, very different sensation of anticipation compared to anything that involved the late Queen. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, we'll find out. If you want to disagree, then um, you know what to do. 03456060973. Uh, it's coming up to 11.29. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'll read this out, but it makes me a bit queasy. I don't know why. I'm not normally um, in any way cowed by controversy. But apart from hiding after Diana's death, the Queen's behaviour and reputation were impeccable. Charles is a public adulterer and an acceptor of huge sums of Middle Eastern money delivered in plastic bags. That's technically all true, but I, I don't know that it's entirely pertinent. The, the money in the plastic bags was for his charitable foundation, for example. He didn't spend it all on sweets, but there are differences perhaps in the perception of probity. Um, I'm an employer. All of my staff are under 28. I respect the royal family, but why am I being forced to lavish them with a gift running into thousands of pounds, salaries plus loss of business, as if times aren't hard enough? Have your coronation on Saturday. Uh, well, I don't know how to break this to you, Ian, but it is on Saturday. Unless I've missed your point. I mean, they get the bank holiday off on the Monday, if that's what you're unhappy about, but the, but the coronation is on Saturday. It's half past 11. Thomas Watts has your headlines. It is 11.33. I think a dish could swing it, don't you? If there's a lack of enthusiasm for King Charles's coronation, and I'm, I'm not saying that myself, although I think it's true. I'm taking it from some fairly extensive polling undertaken by, uh, by YouGov. 
Coronation Chicken was, of course, the work of Constance Spry and Rosemary Hume, um, preparing the food for the banquet of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Um, I, it's, it's funny it caught on, isn't it? You're having a massive banquet for the coronation of a queen and someone said, why don't we have cold chicken in curry sauce? I, 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 mean, I don't know what the takeaway situation was in England in 1953, but I can't imagine they were as thick on the ground as they are now. It's a miracle, really, of, of prescience, incredible visionary uh, understanding from Constance Spry for recognising that by... I mean, 50 years after the event or more, there's 75 years after the event, cold curry out the fridge the next morning after a takeaway is one of the finest culinary achievements that this country has ever witnessed. Arguably, coronation chicken has played a large part in that process. What could King Charles have? Uh, up there with coronation chicken that might just add a patina of, of, of glamour and gourm gourmet, gourmet glamour. Love my alliterations. Gourmet glamour to the coronation. Uh, coronation kebab? Oh, Hello. Cor coronation kebab but no you'd want to keep everybody so it'd have to be that that thing henry riley did with nick the other day the chebab the cheese kebab that could be it get that signed up get that licensed for the coronation and you could you could have what would be the dish because i'm just looking from a pr point of view uh ways you could get the population a little bit more excited about the coronation because at the moment excitement levels are surprisingly low which is what we're discussing where would you go? What would you do? The coronation kebab, a free kebab for everyone in the country. I could get my mates at the British Kebab Awards on board. Celebrate the coronation with a King Charles kebab. I think that'd be quite nice. It fits in with his determination to be the defender of all faiths as opposed to the defender of just one. He's been a great uh, spokesperson for, for diversity for most of his life and tolerance. Probably not equality. I can't really add equality to that list. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. So where is all the excitement? And uh, is it going to turn up in time? Simon's in Romford. Simon, what would you like to say? Yeah, I, I think a lot of the popularity of the monarchy has actually been bound up with the Queen herself. And yes. I just don't think Charles carries the same amount of um, support. No. Uh, I think, as the previous caller said, a lot of people still sort of, the Diana baggage is still a, a bit of a weight. And I also think, it, some people think it's a bit soon after the, the 70th Jubilee last year. It's less than 11 months on, and we seem to sort of going through all through it again. It just seems a, a bit too close to one another. That's um, unfortunate timing. There's nothing anyone could have done about that, is there? No, but but um, I, I just think people think it's a bit too soon for another three parting and more bunting and and. Uh, are are they are there street parties in Romford on the schedule, Simon? Uh, uh, not very many. Um, um, my street might be having one, but it doesn't seem to have, uh, excite uh, cause a lot of excitement. At no, the and, and whereas the Jubilee, the Platinum Jubilee, was was a traffic stopping event, wasn't it? Mm, what was yeah. the one before that? Was it? Oh, it was probably one of the how long? The ninetieth birthday was two thousand and sixteen. That that was quite big. Um, yeah. So um, there is, there is, yeah, there's quite a, a, a trot on there, isn't there? There's quite yeah. a few in a row. So there's two issues there. One is a sort of surfeit of celebration, and the other is the, the different relationship that the population has with the different monarchs. I, I, which do you think is bigger? I think the second one is bigger. Do you? Uh, I, I do. I, I just, I'm, for all that, I think I admire a lot of what Charles has done. I just yeah, don't same. think he's cuts through with, with the population the same way that the Queen did. I don't think he can have the mystique. I, I used that word no. mythical advisedly. I, I, I don't normally go in for that kind of dewy-eyed analysis, but she did achieve something mm. a little bit mythological uh, in that no one really knew anything about her, and yet everyone thought that they knew her. With Charles, arguably, yeah. we know too much about him. I, I think that, that's right, but the Queen was a kind of vacuum in the middle of our, our national life. We, we, mm. we had a picture on the coins and the banknotes and the stamps and everything else, but if we, but she, she managed to avoid us expressing any interesting opinion on any subject for yes. her entire life yes. in, in public. She'd have been a rubbish phone-in host. She would have been. But, uh, <laughs> but it sort of worked for us because we could project what we wanted. We always, we all assumed she agreed with us because we didn't know what she thought. Yes, so that, that sort of worked as, uh, a, yeah. as, a, as a unifying figure. It's very cleverly done. I mean, I know how much of it was deliberate and how much of it was just sort of training or part of character I do not know. But there's definitely something there. The, the street parties are going to be a really good measure actually of what what is going on up and down the country. I, I don't know what, 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 what people have got planned, but I'm not aware of, of the signs going up saying this road will be closed around our way like they did do in previous for previous events. Uh, thank you, Simon. From Romford to Bridlington, Joan is there. Joan, what do you think? Hello. Hello well, um, I have to say, this is my third coronation. Crikey. I, I remember uh, back to 1930. 
seven when the Queen's father was crowned. Yes. Um, now, there was an awful lot of excitement around at that time. I now find myself somewhat surprisingly that um, I'm um, among the uh, uh, quite large percentage of people who really not really much, very much bothered about oh, this one. Gosh. Well, I, and, and when did you register your surprise or your lack of bother? Um well, I think possibly when I when I started listening to your program this morning, and I thought, mm, yes, actually, I'm not really all that bothered about it. I I might watch a bit of it on television, yes, but um, I'm uh, I'm not. Whereas um, the the previous two coronations that I've lived through, um, I was very excited. Actually, I was in hospital on the King's coronation in thirty. Seven. Yes. Um, but there was an awful lot of excitement. I had a huge Union Jack, which I waved around the ward and so on. Um, it was, um, it was. Everybody was very excited. Now, with the Queen's coronation, you have to remember we were only eight years out of the war, the of end course, of the war. Yes. Everything was very still, very um, you know, glum, and um, things were still on ration. Uh, in, and it was a hugely exciting time, a really, you know, sort of lift to everyone. The country feet. needed it. The country needed a good old because knees up. We, we, we did. We, uh, we needed it. I mean, you could say the same now, couldn't you? I mean, we've just come out of the pandemic and so on. You could, actually. I wonder if the last gentleman's point about a kind of a, a bit of a proliferation of parties in recent years might, might, might come into play here. Have you given any thought, Joan, to why your enthusiasm levels are lower than you would have expected? Well, I, I have tried to think it over, and that's when I, I sort of realise, oh, well, yes, well, do, do remember, you know, things were very glum when the yes, Queen was yes. um, crowned. Um, uh, you know, um, and so on, um, and um, could be that. And and uh, of course, it's rather more glamorous having a queen there. I mean, with all the, you know, the uh, the, the discussion about what dress she was going to wear, oh, and yes. all the train bearers, yeah. union, all the train bearers for all the rest. It's much more glamorous, isn't it? Well, well there's more for um, the commentators to talk about actually, and there's a yeah. youth element there as well because the queen, in particular, and and uh, and um, uh, George the Sixth, they they were still relatively young, weren't they, when they came to the throne yeah. so that sense yeah. of a new beginning was probably a little bit more infectious than it is going to be with king charles and also like you i'm not really bothered about what king charles wears i presume he'll be wearing one of his many uniforms well that was, that, that was my thought i <laughs> guess it probably <laughs> a bunch of mysterious medals that someone <laughs> someone who's not david dimbleby will be able to talk us through the provenance of do we know what's <laughs> happening in bridlington joan are they are they are they closing the are they closing garrison square I, i've not heard any Anything about what's going on in Bridlington? I, I've, I've asked my daughter, who also lives here, but yes. um, uh, she, uh, she's not really terribly interested. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, I haven't heard that I've not been invited to a street party for my street, so no. I don't think that's going to happen. That's not that's not going to um, be a personal. That's not just because you're out of favour with the neighbours, is it, Joan? That's that's that's, that's because uh, there isn't a party. Well, well, um, you know, being uh, you know nearly ninety-two, I don't get out and about an awful lot. Mm. Um, so I, I don't see many of my neighbours, oh. but um, no, it's not that I've fallen out with them. <laughs> I think this is not happening. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Joan. You were exactly the sort of quote I couldn't have hoped to. Have, have had someone listening who'd, who'd got the hat trick. He's going for the hat trick on, on, on May the 6th. But to be able to compare it to the coronation of George VI and Elizabeth II is a, a, a very special perspective. Thank you so much for that. 11.43. And if there is any party in Bridlington, get the invitation to Joan. If she fancies it, get it to her sharpish, please. Roger's in Dorking. Roger, what would you like to say? Well, good morning, James. Nice to speak to you. Yeah, we're Dorking. We're having a party. We're having a street party, James. Hooray. Yeah. Good. We're getting behind it, James, OK? All the neighbours are getting behind it. In fact, I had a WhatsApp for my granddaughter this morning. Pops, can we come down and watch it with Well, that's you? nice. What, yeah. where, how, how would you explain the broader lack of enthusiasm this time well, around? Can I just challenge you on that Gov poll? I, obviously, I appreciate it's a poll, but I'm one of the over... You know, I'm over the 70s, and I, I can remember the, the coronations uh, on somebody's shoulder watching it through mm. uh, a local TV shop, you know, and, and then with those little mirrors. This is a 
James, this is a special occasion. Yeah, there will be people and some of your listeners who won't want to participate, but this is a special. Let's take away all the politics around it, etc. It is a special occasion, and, and I think we should celebrate it. We're going to do it in Dorking style. I, I, I mean, yeah. I've got no beef with, with any anything that you're saying, I, I, but, the, but the sense that it is not as eagerly anticipated as any of the last two or three obvious royal yeah. moments of royal pageantry isn't really up for debate, Roger. I think I think you should. Uh, I don't know if you listen to David Starkey the other evening on, on one of your other stations, and, and he he was basically saying, "We, he, due respect to the king, he's taken away a bit of the pomp, you know, not having the Lords and all that." I think we should have had a bit more pomp there, but it, it is a special occasion. Well, yes, I know you you, do, you, you you keep saying that, and I, I'm not disputing the specialness of the occasion, but you, you keep avoiding the question, which is what I'm genuinely interested in, of, of why there's so much less enthusiasm, possibly not in your heart. But in the country at large, I mean, Joan in Bridlington, she she was yeah, she was Joan, around for George the Sixth's coronation, <laughs> and she's left very cold, or at least lukewarm, by the prospect of this one. I'm surprised by the lack of excitement, actually. Would you would you say it's? Uh, I suppose the younger generation a bit of apathy there. It's right? not just the younger generation. I mean, your your generation has got a very surprisingly high figure for people who either don't care at all or very much. That's up to fifty three percent, which would simply not have happened. And if someone had predicted this a year ago, I. I would not have bought it. I would not. I'd have said, nah, no chance. But good luck to you. I mean, and I hope your granddaughter does come along for a lovely day out in Dorking. Um, uh, but it is, it, it's not quite counting versus opinion. But I do, I do think that both anecdotally and statistically, the suggestion that this is not anything like the national event, the eagerly anticipated national event, that anything from the uh, the, 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 the Platinum Jubilee in, in 2022 to the big birthdays of the Queen... Um, uh, even the Olympic opening ceremony, actually, which which was a moment of epic pageantry, it's just not it's just not reaching the parts, is it? Eleven forty six is the time. Eleven forty nine is the time. What should we do next? I, I'm just going to finish up. I could carry on with this. Actually, no one's come up with a recipe. No one's going to beat the coronation kebab, are they? That would just be perfect. A coronation kebab. What would you put in it? Imagine what was it like in 1950? What's it? When they said, "What's the dish? We've got a special dish for the queens." I mean, I, I thought Joan made an excellent point about the Second World War still being very, very much in uh, in the rearview mirror, very close to to, um, uh, to the year of the coronation, but and and therefore rationing probably still were some rationing in place was there in fifty three. If not, it would be a very fresh memory. So probably just the idea of having fresh chicken would have been quite exciting. But someone came, someone said, "What they're going to do? They're doing a special dish." For the jubilee, they do it for the coronation, even a special dish. What's in it? It's cold chicken and curry sauce. That's in 1953. I don't think that cold chicken on the morning after a takeaway had become one of the national fav- nation's favourite dishes until about the 1980s. Cold chicken and curry sauce. What did they serve it with? Did they serve it with rice? Do you think? Probably. I can't. I'm just genuinely shocked by that. When you think about it, we've all been talking about coronation chicken. Um, do you, I bet you're less familiar with Jubilee chicken in 2022. Several dishes. Um, but the Jubilee chicken, which was created for the Silver Jubilee of George V in 1935, was based on chicken dressed with mayonnaise and curry powder. This is getting ridiculous. If you want a dish to celebrate a coronation, it's just chicken curry. Whether it's hot or cold doesn't seem to matter. Oh, hang on. The second version of Jubilee chicken was radically different. Didn't really catch on, did it? it? It was sent out in hampers to guests at all the concerts for the for the Jubilee. Um, but the recipe, a variation of, doesn't seem to have been sent out to the to the public. Cold golden Jubilee chicken is cold dish comprises of chicken in a white coloured sauce dusted with parsley and lime segments, Ew. creme fraiche and mayonnaise flavoured with lime and ginger. That doesn't really tickle my fancy. Heston Blumenthal did one in 2012. I can't find the recipe for it, but it was a variation of coronation chicken. Uh, and in 2002, all I've got is that it was radically different from coronation chicken and highly publicised at the time as a modern evolution of coronation chicken. But I can't find any evidence of what it is. That's where they've gone wrong. I can't find any mention of the latest iteration of coronation chicken. And they've only got three weeks and one day to go. 11.52. If you're listening at the Palace, Coronation Kebab, it's not too late. I've got contacts. I could make some calls. My mate Ibrahim Dugas, who runs the British Kebab Awards, he, if he can't pull this off, nobody can. The man's a machine. Absolutely astonishing organiser of events and people. 
Coronation Street Hot Pot, suggests Dave, who I don't think is taking this terribly seriously. Ditto, this is unsigned text. The sweet and sour coron sweet and sour coronation chicken. Uh, Francis is in Warminster. Francis, what's going on? Well, I think it's going to be a plant-based dish for starters, but um, <laughs> that wasn't why I called. <laughs> yes, coronation couscous. Um, what's going on? Um, I just had a bit of a laugh with your uh, young assistant. Um, about 90% of British people being apathetic about most things. Oh, yes. OK. Um, well, what Is I that true? Really, well, what I did, I, when I looked at these stats a little bit earlier yes. today, I looked back at what the figures were for the Platinum Jubilee. Oh, yeah. And they're kind of real similar. They're down. These ones are down a bit. So it's very interested. 11% versus 9%. A fair amount was... Uh, 32 versus 24. Right. Not very much, 35. So the vast majority of people in the not very much, fair amount, we St don't really care. Staying similar. Um, and 29% not at all for coronation versus 25. Mm. for not at all interested. Um, so I think, you know, this with, along with pretty much anything else, we, listening to your show maybe, and mm. sp certainly speaking to you, are the 5% at either end of the scale that we... Could be right. To be prompted to so, pick up the phone, you'd have to have a slightly stronger opinion one way or the other, perhaps, yeah. than, than, than somebody in the, in, the, in the big middle. But you must yeah. recognise... Uh, the statistics are interesting, but you must recognise the national mood has been different. It does not feel like yeah. all eyes are focused on, on three weeks tomorrow, whereas... Yeah, we don't certainly aren't focused on it um i'm not sure what the date on that polling for the platinum jubilee was no. it's sometime may 22 so and i can't remember when the platinum jubilee was so um no but it would it, increase as you get closer it would increase you, as you get definitely closer expect that to happen. and it was a different question that was asked as well so the question before was are you interested and this is do you care mm. and i just wonder you know if you're graham smith ceo of republic you presumably care a great deal about the coronation. <laughs> oh, I see what. I oh, yeah, no, I see what you mean. As in, you do but, care um, about it, but not in a, not in a passionate, in a positive passionately it, positive way. What are you going to be uh, doing? What's happening in Warminster? Um, well, I live in a village nearby, and it's Bunting's a go go. Um, <laughs> is it already? <laughs> uh, not quite. Yet. No. Well, this is a very military area. We have a lot of flags around year round and there will be any excuse for a, a sort of patriotic front not quite patriotic front but that's a choice of what when, when, no, um, I, yeah no, i hear you um i just tried was it this when was the platinum jubilee last year no no it was in 2022 but what day because you said the polling was in may yeah i think it, I think it was in june because i think the, the, her coronation was in june it was in february the accession was in february yeah, but I think the Co Jubilee celebration was in June because February is too cold and wet and horrid. Yeah, it must have been. Um, so have we got beacons this time? Have we got beacons? I've not heard anything about I beacons, but I've not heard anything. We've not heard anything about very much. Well, though. that's part of the point, isn't it? It's a bit chicken and egg now. Is it? Is it? Is it yeah. the lack of interest explaining the lack of excitement, or the lack of excitement explaining the lack of interest? I like a it's beacon. A bit of a bit of, bit of both, and there's a lot of background noise as well that. Most people don't follow, but if you're on Twitter or social media, you will have seen a lot of it. To the, to the most popular phone-in show on British commercial radio, that would give you an insight into what, what other people are feeling. I hear you. Francis, bunting a go-go. That's, 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 that's what you would have expected, isn't it, for something like this? Um, uh, Jorrit is in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Jorrit, let's, let's have the international perspective. Oh, dear. For, on behalf of the entire world. Yes, I'll, please. I'll, I'll yes. do my best. Thank you. It's an honor to be on. <laughs> I come from a monarchy myself, and I fear that what you're indicating... Do you, you, do you mean you, you are a member of a royal family, or you come from a country with a monarchy? I, I met several. Like, like a, no, 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 no. But I, I, the, 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 the Netherlands, the of course. king, yes. you know, ostentiously rides a bike, is very much a monarchy. Yes. Um, I, I would say that, unfortunately, the question you're asking, and thank you for asking it, is an indication of something bigger, which is mm. that um, what was buried with her late majesty, the queen, and I'm not from your country, though sure. I love it dearly. Thank you. Um, uh, was our sense of commonality. 
And uh, I think for one to be invested or even have the bandwidth uh, to watch these big national events, Mm. you have to be invested in you have to be invested in society. Yes. You have to be invested in this thing that we all have together. And that requires a sense of common investment. It requires a trust in leadership, of which the king is a symbol. And it requires a sense of upward mobility, James. And mm. since we do not, my generation doesn't, but I'm 42. My boyfriend, surprisingly, is 25. Yes. Generation Z. They've grown up without hope. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it's baffling. I used to think, and I think you did, that climate change was going to be something we would fix together. Yes. That homeownership was attainable. All these things. Those things are not the case for but, people but then, but then younger I, than 35. I'd, I'd, I'd refer you to Joan in Bridlington, though, who remembers George VI's funeral. And, uh, it, I mean... That was in the aftermath of the Second World War and the dreams of... Which provided that excess... Ex, sorry to interrupt. No, the commonality. The commonality was there. Stronger than ever. Stronger yeah. than ever. Yeah, I yeah. was just picking up yeah. on the homeowner aspiration and, and economic equality. But, of course, there was a feeling then of being at the bottom of a hill. that Things were going to get better and better well, and, and it better. it was pre-Thatcher and, 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 and somebody accidentally or on purpose destroying your country. But, yeah. I hear you. Well, Sorry, no, the word I, home ownership triggered me there. No, I bet. I, no, I bet it did. I, of course, it did. I mean, you're looking at this. You're looking at someone in a golden coach about whom you know an awful lot, including some quite intimate and uncomfortable details, as a consequence both of indiscretion and tabloid journalism. And you're being asked to almost plug into a into a medieval sense of homage, of homage, of of, of reverence, and that with the late queen, you could. It's, you talk about commonality. Oddly, you're both part of the same thing, despite the enormous gulf in status. And yet, with King Charles, perhaps, it's going to be rather harder for people to straddle that gulf in status. I don't know. That's a really interesting point. Thank you. Uh, it's coming up to 12 noon. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm thinking about talking about snoring next. Don't laugh. It's a very, very serious matter. <sighs> so... I haven't decided. I've got two very different stories in front of me now. It's fair to say that my crack team of radio professionals have not embraced either of them with particular enthusiasm. Can you guess which one the producer responded to by saying, oh, God, that's so boring. I don't think it's boring, but what do I know? Uh, Or the other one, which just might be a little bit repetitive. One in ten people think about walking out on their partner over snoring. And, and I'd, I'd want to talk about that in a light-hearted and simultaneously serious way, as only we can. But the other one is is this little fracture that's appeared in the Conservative High Command over plans to crack down on Airbnbs in tourists. That's not as interesting, is it? That's not as interesting as snoring. I don't. I don't quite get it. I don't see how it's going to. Um, I don't see how it's going to make a, an appreciable difference to housing problems. You need to be building houses, not just stopping people from. Having two, um, too little, too late would probably be the best way to de- describe Michael Gove's proposal. So we'll do that then. Um, it's 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 a survey undertaken for spec savers actually, but uh, it, it looks to be it looks to be above board. Uh, Relate have got involved as well, and it's something that we all snigger about. And yet I, despite it, I was going to start calling twelve o'clock on Fridays fun time Fridays. But everybody looked at me as if I was some sort of uh, criminal when I suggested that. So I dropped that idea. I I think it's that kind of lighthearted whimsy that has you tuning into the program every day. But apparently calling 12 o'clock on Fridays, fun time Fridays, and then choosing a deliberately more lighthearted topic is, is not, you know, not to be encouraged. So this definitely isn't fun time Friday. But I do want to focus on the seriousness of it because if you've not had this in your life like really bad snoring then you think it's something funny it's a little bit les dawson isn't it it's sort of a little bit jokey picture posters seaside postcards not smutty but funny snoring and and yet looking at this research for some couples it's absolutely huge it's a huge issue Largely for the person being kept awake who is going to lie there getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And the more tired you are, then the angrier you're going to get, which means you're waking up. So the suggestion is that relationships can fail as a consequence of snoring. 
And when I saw the headline, I sniggered inwardly, not outwardly. I didn't snigger that much. It was a mild snigger. And yet, when I read into it and thought about it, I've got a mate, actually, who's been sleeping on the sofa for the best part of a decade. It's played absolute havoc with his relationship. And you sort of think, oh, get over yourself. There's always stuff on the telly about how you can stop snoring. Have you tried swallowing a tennis ball or something such nonsense like that? But actually, you shouldn't snigger at stuff like this. Um, you really shouldn't. If it's ending relationships or threatening relationships, or even if you're just still together, but it is an enormous, enormous elephant in the room. I almost literally. I, I want to talk about it. I just want to know what it's like. So about a quarter of the respondents said that they regularly left the bed and slept in another room because they couldn't take it anymore. I, I Again, I don't want to get too intimate, but I, I find that really sad. I, I, you know, if you're lucky enough to live with someone that you really, really love, then waking up next to each other is one of the loveliest things that can happen in a relationship, isn't it? And and yet there it is. Over a quarter of, of people quizzed said that they'll leave the room because they couldn't take it anymore. 8% have thought about ending their relationship. 28% have woken up every single night. There's a, a therapist with Relate who said that it's a recurrent theme in session. So you go for marriage guidance and snoring comes up. It can cause real resentment between a couple, particularly if the snoring partner doesn't see it as a problem and won't seek help. So there it is. It doesn't need much of a setup from me. It's a story about relationships being threatened and even broken by snoring um, and sleeping separately as well. I don't, I, you know, I know posh people do it, but it's not normal, is it, to, to sleep separately through choice? I just think that's quite sad. Uh, and usually, if it's been discussed or if you've if you've talked about it, then outside of the experience, people won't really have much sympathy with you. What's that? Why are you getting divorced? Oh, he just snores. Yeah, what's the real reason? You're, you're seeing the boss, aren't you? Or you're, you're, you're knocking off the neighbour. What's the real reason you get? No one's going to break up because you're getting divorced. You because you snore. You sleep in separate rooms? Yeah, it's because she snores. She snores like a bison. Yeah, but why are you really sleeping in separate rooms? I don't, I don't think people take it... Well, I'm taking it seriously now. Being And, and this is uh, something else that the couples and sex therapist with Relate, Peter Saddington, said. This is, this is very much what I believe. Being in bed together at the end of the day is often when couples have sex, cuddle or kiss and share pillow talk. It's a crucial part of the relationship. You do a little audit, don't you? Particularly if you're parenting at the time. You do a little audit of what's up and what's down, what needs to be doing, what we're up to, how did that go, how's she getting on, what we're doing tomorrow, where do I need to be? I don't know where the cuddling, kissing and sex comes into things, but you certainly do, you certainly do a little audit of your day. And yet snoring can um, absolutely destroy relationships. I, I want this to come from a position of respect, actually, and concern, with perhaps a small side order of levity. But the more I read and the more I think and the more I look at it, and I suspect the more I listen to callers, the more inappropriate that levity is perhaps going to feel. Phone lines are open, 0345 973 is the number that you need. Let's start in Guildford with Vicky. Vicky, what made you pick up the phone? Exactly what you've just described. Oh, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> my husband and I, we've been married for 12 years. Um, it's just horrific. And I could honestly say to you, I could walk out of my marriage because of it. Oh. It's horrific. What, what does he say when you tell him how you're feeling? <laughs> He just, he, because he doesn't hear it, or no. he's not affected by it, he just says to me, well, what do you want me to do about it? And to be fair, he, we did go to the doctors and um, he had an operation on his nose. So that was initially the first thing that, um, that they did, mm. um, which was fine. And we were like, oh, my God, this could be like, uh, you know, the, uh, this could like change everything. Yeah. Um, it didn't. Oh. So we've tried sprays in the mouth, sprays up the nose. We've tried um, like putting a, like a thing up the nose, yeah. um, a mouth guard. So we he is trying. Then he's not. He's not. He's, oh. he's not un, uh, unconcerned about it all. Could you try again? No, what, what absolutely. So he he tries. He's tried all of that, and um, literally. So if we go on holiday, our holidays cost double the price because we have to get an apartment with two bedrooms. Whoa! Seriously? <laughs> seriously? If we go away anywhere, we have to get a place with two bedrooms. Um, he sleeps downstairs every night on the sofa, every night. Oh, I feel sorry I for mean, him. But I should be I feeling know. sorrier for you, really, shouldn't I? I don't know. Who should I feel sorrier for on this one? And the thing is, I, you know, I, 
and sometimes I say, don't worry, I'll go on the sofa. So yeah. sometimes I do sleep on the sofa. I work n- um, two nights out of four shifts, so he has the bed then. It's oh. horrific. It's horrific because we, you know, you, you want to get intimate, so you do that, and then it's like, bye then. Oh, no, that's terrible. <clears throat> like ships that I pass know. in the night. Yeah, it is, honestly. What, um, I, how can I phrase this delicately? Had you not spent the night together much before you got married? Do you know what? When we got married, he didn't snore. What's happened then? That's what I mean. I don't know. I mean, I, I said to him, maybe it's because he's put a bit of weight on. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. We all put weight on, don't we? But at the end of the day, I said yeah. to him, you know, and it's not as easy to lose it. We're not young. No. And I'm not saying, you know, go off and lose five stone, please. I mean, no, he's not that much no, of a weight. No, but, no. you know, I can't, you know, make him do that. And like you said, we have tried everything. Oh, that's brutal, isn't it? And it's just, and it's like, I just feel like it's driving, it drives me out. Even my children in the bedrooms go, oh, we heard Daddy snoring again last night. Oh, it's dear. literally like he rocks the whole house. Well, you never know. Someone listening might might have some sort of solution to it. Does he, does he have a drink every night, if you don't mind me asking? No, he doesn't drink oh, and doesn't smoke. It's not that then? No. Just no, just, oh, honestly. Oh, and, and, think... and, and was the operation on the nose because of the snoring? Was that... what? Initially, we went and the doctor did say he could see it was a bit crooked inside. So they shaved off some bone and we thought, oh, my God, this is like the answer to our prayers. It, it, because oh. the airway was a bit restricted. Yeah. But I've literally like, um, and even sometimes when he's awake, yeah. I feel he can even be snoring when he's awake. And I look at him and I just think, what oh, you? my God. Yeah, you would do, wouldn't you? Oh, I don't <laughs> Oh, I'm 52-48 on this, Vicky. I don't know who to feel sorry. It's the infernal ratios, Carl. I didn't think we'd be bringing Brexit into a conversation about snoring, but I honestly don't know who I feel sorry for. Probably depending on what, what part of the cycle that you're in, the bit where he sort of grabs his grabs his pillow and slumps downstairs for another night on the sofa. Know, that's, do you know what? That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> we'll sit in bed, we'll like have a chat, and yeah. blah, 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 whatever, and then I go, night, then he goes, night, then he picks up his pillow, and off oh, he goes. Bless him. I saw him, and bless and, and then, of course, when you do sp- spend the night in the same bed, you're, you're going to be lying there at four o'clock in the morning tearing your oh, own no, hair. Oh, no, yeah, it's horrific. It's literally horrific. I'm just literally... But then, like you've just said, I wind myself up then so much, I get so angry and cross. No, I bet you do, because it's the worst. It's like torture, isn't it? I mean, sleep deprivation <laughs> is a form of torture. Yeah, literally, yeah, that's absolutely. not even a figure of speech. That's what they do. Have you yeah. looked into sleep apnea? Lots of people always talk about that. Aren't these? And do you know what? what? This is really weird, because he's actually having a sleep test done at the moment oh, so we're in the middle of that so, I mean don't get me wrong you know the doctors and that have been amazing and you know and that's so we are in the middle of that at the moment so like you said fingers crossed something yeah, might come out seriously. of that but we'll see we will see yeah. and, and it's hard to know what then I presume actually finally I presume your friends don't take it as seriously as they would another issue that was putting similar levels of pressure on your relationship no, no. And and you know what the thing is? I, I, I love him so much and I wouldn't leave him. But no, I know. The, the frustration at the time when I oh, in the like moment. Said, I'm deprived of sleep and, yeah. you know, and all of that. I'm like, oh, I can't cope with this anymore. But, no, because he's yeah. sleeping. That's why snores are double bubble, aren't yeah, they? So yeah. it's not just the snoring. Yeah. It's the fact that he's away yeah. with the fairies while you're yeah. lying there in yeah. absolute agony. Living his best life. Living his best life. <laughs> Oh, I hope it works. I really do. It sounds promising, but but I, I can always tell when something's significant because 200 people send me the same words. They're all various spellings, though, I have to tell you that, but then apnea is quite a tricky one to spell. Uh, it's quarter past 12. 18 minutes after 12 is the time, and, and there it is. I mean, set the tone quite beautifully for a conversation about why snoring is a lot more serious than you realise. And if you're just tuning in and you're wondering why we're not talking about the major issues of the moment, we often do stories like this. I'm fascinated by what the world looks like through other people's windows, stuff that you don't know. You know, I, I know what my life is like, uh, and, and I don't know what it's like to be with someone that you love the bones of, but who snores like a bison all night every night, and it puts enormous stresses on relationships to the point of possible breakup. I, mean, I wouldn't, until today, I would not have thought that snoring popped up often in, for example, marriage guidance counselling, because you just think that's about much more serious communication breakdowns or infidelities or what, but no, you just imagine what it would be like if every time you fell asleep, someone came and gave you a little poke and woke you up all night long, all night long. Uh, Charlotte's in Horsham. Charlotte, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Charlotte. Um, firstly, you are a broadcasting and journalistic hero of mine, oh, so it is a genuine you. honour to speak to you. I didn't know where we were going uh, with that, Charlotte. I got a bit worried for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, secondly, I have ADHD, so if I go off on a tangent, 
Yes. Just give me the phone nudge and I'll try and lead myself back on to where I, I, we were going. I'll do my best. Um, so I want to come at this with you from another angle in the sense that I'm the one that snores. Uh, so, and it really affected my relationship. Yeah. I was, I've got sleep apnea and right. I was... What does that mean? What does that apnea. mean? What does that mean? Do we know exactly what that means? So basically what that means is you have moments of REM sleep, so your rapid eye movement sleep, and there, that is the sleep where you're dreaming and you're, yeah. you know, you're having an amazing time out for dinner with your dream girl and all of those types of things. That is the restorative sleep. So that mm. is the sleep where you are repairing yourself. Your mind is very calm. It's, yes. you know, it's slowing itself down. Your heartbeat is slower. And that is the sleep that we all need to wake up in the morning and think, okay, cool. Mm. I can do mm. today. Today mm. is good. As someone who has sleep apnea, I don't get that REM sleep. Uh. So what was happening is I was snoring very, very loudly. Um, and mm. my brain was waking me up enough to go, Charlotte, you're not breathing. Oh, God. Breathe. Yeah. So I stopped breathing when I sleep. Right. Um, and I didn't know any of this. And it was during, it actually turned out this relationship was abusive and I didn't see it. But I was sleeping on a single mattress on the floor in my living room while he was in a king size bed in the bedroom. God, what a charmer. I, I mean, we all make mistakes. We do. Um, a bit yeah. of a clue there, though. Oh, so. <laughs> the red flags were. Oh, no. I'm, 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 I'm joining you in looking back on it with relief. I'm not. I'm certainly not in any way criticising you. But what I will say is, I am so embarrassed. I mean, even mm. while I was on hold, I was thinking, "Oh, I'm going to take my other half, a different person now, absolute mm. dream of a human being, my mm. best friend." And I am so incredibly lucky to have him by my side. But I thought. I'm going to text him and be like, my gift is speaking to James O'Brien because I'm really, really excited because <laughs> he knows how much I absolutely adore you. He knows that. Right, I've got to steer you back. I'm, my, steering, I'm my, steering you back now. I'm steering you back. My dreams and a Steering you back to the topic. Then I was, so he, does he I not know thinking, how, Does he not know how bad it can be, your snoring then, yet? Or, he does right. because like I said to your lady, yeah. your, either your producer, producer or your researcher, yeah. I never want producer. Always say producer. Lady. If in doubt, just say producer. Okay, thank you. Um, but when we first met and we started to, you know, stay over at each other's houses, yeah. I wouldn't sleep. Oh, boy. Because I was so embarrassed to take over. I've got a CPAP machine, which is an oxygen mask that I wear every night. Right. That constantly blows oxygen into into my face, essentially. Yeah. Uh, that keeps me, allows me to have that REM sleep. Oh, wow. But I'm 32. We've been together nearly three years. So we met when I was just just turned 30. Yeah. I'm 33 in a couple of months, and I thought, well, that's not attractive, is it? When did you know, how I'm, long how long were you together before you before you got it out before you told him? About two or three months, maybe. Yeah. Okay. And and he's cool with it. So does that help the snoring as well? Does the machine help the snoring as well? It stops the snoring well, because then, okay. my throat isn't so, so, closing up. Well, that's really interesting. I'm so, breathing. Brilliant. So, I, I, in a way, you're a good story. You're a, you're a, you're an inspirational story for other people listening to this. Albeit that you've got a fairly hefty piece of equipment in the bedroom. I might want to rephrase that. Actually, you've got you've got. I you've, would, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but it, as you say, it's not it's, it's not something you'd want to crack open the first time you stayed over, is it? No, and it's. Thankfully, there's people uh, like Roman Kemp coming out now and saying, you know, I've got sleep apnea, I've got a CPAP machine, which for people of my generation oh, yeah. is absolutely incredible because it's taken me a long time. And I thought I was going to say, you know, I was going to text my other half and say, mm. you know, I'm, I'm going to be speaking to James O'Brien. Yeah. And I thought, no. Not about this. Because he's then going to say, oh, Charlotte's on the radio and all his technician, he's a, he's a mechanic, so all the techs are going to be around him. And then I'm thinking... He's not going to want them to know that he's Mrs. Weatherface Mask, right? Oh, I know you might be so right, but work, work, workplace badinage and banter is, 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 is you know, exactly. yeah, I, I hear you. And it is as as with the as with everyone actually getting in touch, and it has gone absolutely bonkers. This, but the um, that that no one really takes it seriously. No, no one outside of no. your relationship, because your partner would take it seriously if you're the one doing the snoring. The one doing the snoring, mm -hmm. you obviously take it very seriously. But I'm hearing from other people whose partner doesn't really take it that seriously because they're not aware of how bad it is. But outside of that, 
bubble outside of that relationship, people are not going to appreciate the seriousness of the of the of the set situations you describe, are they? Your mate, your friends aren't really going to. His friends certainly aren't really going to. But it's quite I lonely. To quite that, quite lonely. Yeah, it is. But to the people that are snoring, yes, if they are waking up and they just think, "Oh my god, I could sleep for a week," mm. or they've got this banging headache that kind of goes all over your head and you just think oh my god my head feels so heavy that i don't actually think i can hold it up go and see your doctor because they are all signs of sleep apnea yeah i think that's a reason why lots of people are sending this to me so that, that is I mean, it's, what's the worst that can happen you haven't got it you know you don't you've lost nothing you haven't have got you? it uh, yeah. or you've got it and the first night i spent with that machine probably something i should rephrase but the first <laughs> night i spent with so my auntie machine doris and has Warwick. just tuned in as if what on earth is yeah. this woman talking about <laughs> where, and where can i get one <laughs> so that scene in when harry met so no i hear you it oh was, well that's lovely i that, woke up yeah and couldn't believe it i just woke up and just thought oh my god this is what actual i, I feel normal what is this? Yeah, no, crikey. And, and there'll be so many people who, who haven't ever made it for, for reasons, you know, thinking that there is no answer, being embarrassed, like you, you described really well, and, and just sort of that, that weird sense of lethargy strokes plus shame. Thank you, Charlotte. I hope it lived up to your expectations. It was very kind compliments at the, at the top of the show. Um, 25 minutes after 12 is the time. Um, I, I, it's going to be one of those where lots of people are getting in touch with quite personal information and I'm, I always feel bad when I can't get through all of that because obviously it's it, 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 it this is it, I mean crikey some of these I've been sleep deprived for years living with a snorer we still have a strong relationship we laugh about the time in desperation I put a pillow on his head and sat on it and then realized that he might die so I slept in the hotel bath instead um sleep headphones Jennifer Ann suggests I'm a terrible snorer snorer my poor partner has suffered um, but we are cheesy and struggle to sleep if we aren't together. He discovered headboards with speakers built in, so puts them on when he gets into bed and plays some sleep story podcast and drops off. Uh, Catherine tells us that the menopause can exacerbate the issue. Many women struggle to sleep or sleep much more lightly because of it. Add in the noise from a partner and the rage is, is real. And Jack, I'm not sure, mate, that you're entering into the spirit of things here. My next door neighbours can hear me snoring. I am strangely proud of it. My neighbour compared my snoring to a diesel engine leaning against the adjoining wall. Yeah. Uh, Lynn's in Mansfield. Lynn, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. So, thanks so much for having me on. You're I'm absolutely well. nervous about talking <laughs> to you, and my husband's probably sitting there thinking, I can't believe she's going to have this conversation. <laughs> but um, I moved from New York 17 years ago because I fell in love with a guy. He did warn me beforehand that he snored. Right. And I, I never really, I was like, yeah, no big deal. Everyone sure. snores. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. snores so loud that in the 17 years I've lived in England, I have not had a solid night's sleep. Oh, my days. And it's because I I won't go to bed without him. And sure. I know for some people, they're probably thinking, just go. We have separate rooms. I sleep in a separate room, but I have to go to bed with him every night. It's yeah, my husband. Of course. I love him. Yeah, I know. You know. I get that. I really do. So then you get up in the night and shift rooms. Yeah. I mean, well, hang on, no, Hang on. There'll be a few people listening. Why doesn't he? Well, well, I, because it's me, I think, part of it, because I'm the light sleeper. I'm the one that, you know, he breathes wrong, and I can hear it, and okay. i got to get up. So part of that could be the fact that I am a light sleeper. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. hear a pin drop. I just can't get to sleep. I'll be watching telly in bed, and he fell asleep, and then I'm humping and saying, we, you're snoring. And and have have you not done anything? Have you never tried to get medical help, or have you done we, it all? We've tried everything. The last thing I bought was a 45-pound pair of earbuds that are titanium that were supposed to, like, clear everything. It doesn't. I can hear him. He's been to the doctor who said it's not uh, because I thought it sounded like it was a a nasal issue. Yes. And they said it's a jaw issue, and they can't. They gave him, like, a a mouthpiece, which then he spits out in the middle of the night. Um, And like your other caller, it's very hard to go on holiday because you're stuck in a room and there's nowhere to go. I couldn't believe that. I mean, I'd believe it now because I'm being bombarded with similar experiences. Mm. But having to book book an apartment with an extra bedroom so that you can both... And then uh, our other text to there sleeping in the bath sleeping in the hotel bath again I, 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 I mean I, I, I don't know if it's cruel but I, w- I do I do note that it's the sufferer rather than the snorer that seems to be enduring the 
my mate's been sleeping on a sofa for eight years because he snores. If it was the other yeah. way around, I don't know. It's an interesting power balance in play there, Lynn. I will say that my husband has always said I'll go in the other room. But okay. for me, I think it's my issue. I'm the one that okay. can't get over the fact that he's snoring. And we're just getting ready to go on a cruise. And I'm starting to freak out I because I'm thinking are. there's going to be nowhere for me to go. No, well, you've just got um, the one cabin, have you? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, but you know, what are you going to do? I'm going to have to suck it up and just, you know, it's funny because we fight in the middle of the night if we're yeah. on holiday, and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I say you're snoring, he says I know, and then we fight, 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 and then in the morning it's like nothing's ever happened because it's just a way of life now. Fair and enough. No, well, I like I, your philosophical attitude to it. It's this probably the the New Yorker in you, isn't it? Just rolling with it, could rolling be, with could the, be. rolling with the punches. But I mean, I'm glad we're having this conversation because lots and lots of people are deriving great comfort from company and just knowing that other people do understand what they go through on a nightly basis. And the numbers are stunning. The numbers of of, of people affect twenty eight percent woken up every single night. Eight percent have thought about ending their relationship. That number's probably higher if you caught someone at three o'clock in the morning, but it's when you're doing a calm survey for Specsavers or whoever it is that's... I think that it is actually, in this occasion, Specsavers who've sponsored the, the, the research. But you, you say someone at three o'clock in the morning when they've just been woken up for the 14th time, is, would this ever threaten you? Yes, it would, but not in the cold light. So do you see what I mean? It's, it's, it's all there. Half past 12 is the time. Amelia Cox has your headlines. It is uh, 12.34. Sleep apnea can be a very, very serious condition, is a very, very serious condition, link, linked to all sorts of much more profound medical issues than, than simple snoring. So anyone listening to this thinking, I wonder, don't, don't put it off. Just get, get it checked out. Jamie puts it very powerfully. As a, as a previous heavy snorer, anyone with similar issues should get a sleep test for apnea. You can get it privately for about 100 quid or, or wait for the NHS. After I scored highly, a CPAP machine, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, that's what Charlotte introduced us to, cured my snoring, made my missus happier, and I no longer fall asleep at my desk in the afternoon. Because that, that's the other point, isn't it? You're not getting your REM sleep. You're going to be shattered all day, every day. Um, this, I, I, I shall read this out because it made me smile, but I don't know how helpful it is to anybody else from Pebbles. My wife has absolutely no issues with my loud snoring, James. She's profoundly hard of hearing. She just takes her aids out, goes to sleep, and wakes up refreshed. I, I, yeah, I mean, all human life is here. 12.35 is the time. And I would like this from Lee. Mexico Riviera, 2009. My 40th, my partner had to drag the cushions from the chaise long and sleep on the bathroom floor due to my snoring. I'm ga- and and you, you've tagged your partner Josie into that. I'm, I, yeah, I, I'm just, this, there's something going on here. I wonder what the jury would say on the question of who should move? Who should move? The snorer or the snorey, if that's the right word to use. I would have, I would have thought the snorer was the one doing the moving, but... It would appear not. It would appear my old mate is um, in a bit of a minority on this one. Mustafa is in Cheshire. Mustafa, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Big fan. Thank you, mate. Um, so I've been with my lady for <laughs> over 10 years. And um, my snoring is was bad, but I didn't know how bad it was. So one day I downloaded the app and yeah. my snoring was hitting... It records your snoring and talking, so... My snoring was hitting about 118 to 120 decibels. What's that equivalent to? That's you... equivalent to um, a chainsaw. On. Shut the front door, seriously. Yeah. And so your partner, it... your partner had told you this, but you'd thought she was exaggerating. Yes. So I downloaded the app, and it gave me every day. And I, I was snoring for about three to four hours a night. Wow. And having said that, she used to get to sleep about two in the morning. Right. You know. Yeah. So. It wasn't fair on her. So anyway, um, and not not to mention, I talk in my sleep as well. So okay. it got a bit too much. So with the talking, I just sort of got a therapist and that sort of worked. But with the snoring, I had to go to Turkey and get an operation done in my nose. So they, they took bits of, of clogged nasal out of my nose. Eesh. And since then... That happened, that was two years ago. Since then, uh, I've been okay. I snore, but not as loud. Okay. But it was quite sad for her because my kids snore as well. Oh, no. So, so it's a bit of a snoring household, I guess. <laughs> um, why did you have to go to Turkey? So, Because I, I, basically, I went through the NHS. They said they couldn't see anything. Okay. That was, clog, that was clogging my nose. 
And so the game strips, the strips worked for what some time. But then I thought, let me go Turkey. So I went Turkey and they found... But is that, no, because I know it's good for uh, hair transplants at the moment. I keep reading about people going to Turkey for hair transplants. Well, but, and their teeth as well, I guess. And the, yeah. that's it, and the teeth stuff. But is it is it known as somewhere you can go for uh, help? No, with, but because no. I'm Turkish myself. Oh, I see. So uh, you just knew the system over yeah, there. Yeah, my mother-in-law, she's found a doctor over there. I went there. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it worked. It absolutely worked. And my snoring is maybe... 20 decibels now. God, that's bad. yeah, a huge difference then. A huge and, difference. And it was not fair on her, you know what I mean? No, you're right. So who, who would move in the night, you or her? No, I would, who would move, you say? Yeah, who would go to another room or something? Or did, did, did No, did, well, no, she would put up with it. She just pushed her. through. Good Lord. Yeah, sometimes I did go downstairs, but it's not fair on me or her because we're together. We should be sleeping together. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important part of it. And actually, it is picked up in this report today about the intimacy and, you know, just, just the cuddling and the proximity. It's a huge part. I think the New York lady who, who rang in earlier really said that. I don't I don't want to go, go to sleep at night without being next to my husband, without being next to my partner. I like that. I don't know if it qualifies as romantic when you know that you're going to be schlepping the pillow to the spare room in the middle of the night but i get it and and making the effort as well sometimes can be as valuable as whether it succeeds or not because you're showing that you care and you know what it's like thank you mustafa paul's in maidstone paul what would you like to say 120 oh, right, yeah. 120 um, decibels what's on your mind paul <laughs> uh well i was the reason i called was because um i i sort of noticed i was i've been a big snorer in fact recently i don't snore anymore because i lost a load of weight oh yeah um quite quickly um, but when I did, um, eventually we moved from sort of me going up and getting up in the middle of the night and going into a, a spare room to me just always automatically going into a spare room because it was less hassle. Yes. And it kind of created um, a sort of creeping kind of degradation of... What a beautiful uh, phrase. That's a really lovely use of language, a creeping degradation. That's what I worry about when, when, when friends tell me that they're sleeping on the sofa every night. Yeah. Yeah, because you do, you don't really notice it happening, and in the and you're not. It's not that there's any actual big problem. There was, you know, there was a problem in as much as, you know, I was snoring so loudly that my wife was waking me up. You know, all the, in fact, before I got to sleep, I used to snore before I went to sleep, which was quite a weird thing. So she'd say to me, "You're snoring," and I'd be like, "But I'm awake," yeah. and I couldn't hear it myself, which is very peculiar. But sure. it was very very loud, and and so it, it sort of as time goes on, you um, you just learn to adapt, and then. You don't really notice it, but you're sort of thinking, "Oh, I don't feel like I don't, we don't feel like a, a normal couple." And and when no. you really become noticeable, then you go and visit friends or yeah. stay with family, and you're like, "Oh, okay, I'm just gonna have to like creep, get up in the night, and creep down into the into the you know sleep on the sofa, or you know, I mean, I've you know, it, in the end, I've, I've ended up taking camp beds and sleeping in my you know uh, sister's kitchen yeah. and all sorts of things, you know, and and you sort of just feel. Oh, I'm not normal. And now that we're sleeping in the same bed again oh. um, regularly, yeah. it's that real sense of actually it's that waking up in the morning. Funny enough, you'll call us saying going to bed, yes. but actually it's that waking up next to each other, which is really ah. Oh, <laughs> well, we are, we are, are. <laughs> we're animals, aren't we? I mean, yeah. uh, because of my my family's been away a bit this week, and I hate I hate waking up on my own. Hate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it, 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 you know, you just you you end up in a living in a kind of um, a weird. Well, I mean, I was, I was sleeping in the spare room, which is my office. Right. I was just getting up, started working. <laughs> oh, you know, that's depressing. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Yeah. You know? and, and it went on for a long time. And it was just and for it, you, the, the, it was the weight. The weight made the massive difference. Yeah, you know, I, I, I always knew it, that it. When it fluctuated, it got, but, you know, when it, when it, it got worse really when you got bigger. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. And, um, you know, so I guess I was lucky that. I got ill actually, and it made me lose a load of weight. But um, it happened count. very rapidly, and uh, there you go. Yeah, exactly. I'll just make so, sure, you, yeah, keep it off, and then you'll be golden. I love that. Exactly. It's- it's, uh, and and, and there, I mean that is it, isn't it? It's, it's if you don't know it, you don't know it. But the idea of sleeping on a camp bed in your sister's kitchen is crackers until you recognise the reality of what people are going through. Fran has a has an argument on who should move. The snorer doesn't move because they are already asleep and they're not going anywhere. And when you tell them they snore, they often don't believe you, so they still aren't going anywhere. I think that's why Mustafa was such a, a, a gentleman. <laughs> when he got himself with a little app and having spent a few years denying that it could possibly be that bad, realised he was snoring about as loud as a chainsaw. And I, I don't know, if you've never witnessed that, you probably find it hard to believe 
don't you? But if you if you if you make as much noise as you can deliberately while snoring, so you really go for a a loud snore. Some people are doing that in the night, entirely unintentionally, and and unconsciously. So that, however loud you can get it deliberately, that can happen unintentionally. That's probably quite a good way of understanding things. Uh, Jim's in Bognor Regis. Jim, what would you like to say? Hi. Uh, you were talking earlier about a bit of levity. Yes. Um, it, it's not appropriate because it's not funny at all. No, I however, get that. Yeah, however, I, I hang, work, on, hang yeah. on, hang <laughs> on. Where, where are you going with this, however? However. Yes. I, I work um, as an NHS uh, mental health nurse, and I work... Uh, uh, two nights every every other week, right. and uh, when I'm working nights, um, it's great. I can sleep. However, you woke me up because you were on in the background, oh, and sorry. I was woken by the word snoring. Right. So, and then I started listening to the other people talking about you know their experiences yes. and everything. You know, I thought you know Lucy's downstairs listening to this because. Yes. You're on permanently, and Thank you know you. if you're not on, we listen to catch up, and Quite we've right got so. both of your books. Oh, fantastic! Absolutely, yeah. I want them signed one day. Anyway, so you woke me up, and I'm thinking Lucy will be downstairs listening to this, oh. and she came into the room crying. Oh, mate! Because because it was so, it was so, it just reflected everything that we go through. The stress and of it. Oh, yes. And what we're going to do, we're, we're going to go with a united front and both get an appointment with the GP um, and talk it through because we, we we do have an appointment for an assessment, but it was cancelled. Oh, because of the and strike. That's not going, well, no, it, oh. it's just cancelled. And that's going, not going to be there for a while. Okay. But, you know, Lu, Lu, Lucy's distraught because, you know, she doesn't... You know, she hates what it, what it's doing. And if I'm working, because I do 12-hour shifts, so if I'm working at 7 o'clock in the morning, having just finished at 7 in the evening, then she will sleep downstairs, which is a huge, huge sacrifice. Of course and, it is know. for both of you as well. That's, uh, I, yeah. Oh, crikey. I don't, I don't want Lucy to be so hard yeah. on herself, Jim, because there's nothing she can... It's not like she's deliberately waking you up in the night with a slap around the chops or something like that, is it? But I can understand how it must take a toll on her to see the impact that her snoring is having on you. Well, you know, it affects every, almost every aspect of our lives. I mean, yeah. you know, somebody mentioned, you know, to go away. Um, we we inform the uh, the desk at the, you know, reception. Yeah. That, you know, uh, other people may hear snoring. Gosh. Because it, it, it is that loud. Right. Um, I'm sort of used to it now. Of course, but um, still, it's a, it's a. Did they put you in the bridal suite as a result? Did you get an upgrade? <laughs> no, in in the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it! But I, I do I do want Lucy to remember that she's not doing anything, yeah. is she? There's no reason for her. Well, to she's be. downstairs. Well, I'm presume she can so hear I'm me. Really I'm working on the presumption she can hear me, Jim. So I do yeah, I do say yeah. to her live yeah. on the radio that, that you, you need to be kinder to yourself on that because it's not as if you're doing it on purpose or, or, or that you would do it if you had any choice yeah. whatsoever i hope i hope she's picked up some other possible avenues to explore today as well from other calls. well yeah what we did think of you know if um we could rather than wait for um an assessment for a cpac yeah. um just try and find if we can borrow one or something yeah. and then if it works it works and then we don't need an assessment well i'd probably be worth know. getting the assessment anyway i'd go belt and braces would be my feeling on that not least because sleep apnea can have so, such profound uh, consequences in in other areas but i really wish you both well jim i absolutely do it's um there's a real love coming from both of you on that, even though I only spoke to one of you, the idea that she's beating herself up because of the impact that it's having on you and the clear concern you have for the fact that she's beating herself up over the um, impact that it has on you. Uh, that, that's it, isn't it? These, are, these things are sent to triers, and snoring is a much more testing phenomenon than people who haven't had to endure it would, would have appreciated before today. It is 12.51. Listen, I'm going to tell you something that has been recommended by a significant number of callers but before i do it i'm going to check the price because i know i've got some buds from the same people that are they're not cheap and and i don't I, there's no point me mentioning it 
uh, you're just going to go, but they're so expensive, I can't afford... I appreciate that they are expensive, but lots of people have told me that they work. So I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you not to bother texting me to tell me about how expensive they are and how you couldn't possibly afford them. I'm talking about Bose... Is it... I just checked with Keith, who's a DJ at weekends. Is it Bose or Bose? Bose. I've, I've said Bose all my life. But I, why is, does it not have an accent on it? If I imagine that. Bose. Anyway, Bose earbuds. Sleep buds. Lots and lots of people have raved about. Niall uh, as, as, uh, says, save my life. She's ready to suffocate me in my sleep. But they are, they're not, you know, you're not going to get much change out of 250 quid. So it's not going to be an option for everybody. I presume they also work as, oh, hang on. They're the quiet comfort earbuds. The sleep, but how much of the sleep, here they are. How much of the sleep buds? Uh, but yeah, you're still not going to get much change out of that sort of, oh no, that, no, hang on. I should have done this off air, shouldn't I? I'll never learn. But anyway, they're not cheap. So I, I am very, very aware of that. But if you're lucky enough to be able to afford them, I'm seeing gl glowing, glowing reviews of them. Um, I'm going to play you a bit of full disclosure now. It's a cracker. Here, here's the thing. And if she was here, I would ask her whether or not I, what's the best way for me to behave now? Um, it, do I not make a big deal out of some of the stuff that you're going to find confusing about the introduction? Or do I explain why you shouldn't make a big deal about some of the stuff that you might find confusing about the introduction? I think I'm going to lead towards the former because the guest on this week's full disclosure is Susie Eddie Izzard, um, who, as you will know, is a, is a star of stage and screen, has got an amazing one woman show of great expectations coming out. But the reason I mentioned confusion is because if you do find any of this confusing, uh, pronouns or, or, or gender fluidity or whatever it may be, then Susie already, because they are comfortable with both, is supremely understanding and comfortable with other people's confusion. So that, that idea that you need to be on tenterhooks or you need to be on, on thin ice when you're discussing issues that um, that can be very confusing is, is not something that is introduced to the conversation by people like Susie Eddie Izzard. And it was a lovely, lovely interview, as you're about to discover. We went to boarding schools in, in a place called St. John's in Porthcourt, mm. and that was for a year and a bit. And then when we got to back to Eastbourne, my dad had grown right. up. Um, his grandma was born then. He'd, he'd been there from the age of seven. And... Um, that's when I saw a play called The Boy with a Cart by Christopher Fry. Oh, yes. Which is all about St. Cuthbert and his dragging his mother across the southern, a whole, from the, something like Cornwall all the way to Sussex. Mm. I don't know quite what the story is about, but anyway, they were getting a great reaction. I saw this great reaction, particularly the kid who was playing the mother. Um, not that that's got anything to do with sexuality, <laughs> but this kid was just doing good. And. And I thought this reaction I want this love from affection affection from the audience, and 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 uh, I, from that date on I th I have said I, I want to be a, I want to be a performer, and I couldn't get into any of the good any good roles at, uh, at school. They just wouldn't uh, countenance. I think it. I'm a smaller kid. Yes, for one. You, any, you must have been good. No, no. I think if you think about if you did if, did you do anything at school? Loads, they yeah. would give you a page and say read this, yes. and from that reading you you were uh, in or out. Yes. And I'm severely atypically dyslexic, so my reading would have gone, "I, sir, lo Lord, you, but you would just, <laughs> hang on, let me do that again. <laughs> no, no, you're out. Thank you. Next, you know. And I think um, and God. seeing as only a few teachers doing productions, once they'd seen you once, they'd they sort of pegged you down as jailer, 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 probonious in the in the. Uh, so you were a frustrated story. thespian, very frustrated. before you were in double figures oh, age-wise. Yeah. Was I was grabbing was solo was lines. And I said this in my biography when in the the. What, uh, it was uh, Beauty and the Beast. Mm. Beauty and the Beast. I was one of the eight, ten street urchins, kids in in the class who weren't going to be Beauty, weren't going to be the Beast, yeah. weren't going to be Beauty's dad, weren't going to be some other interesting character. <laughs> just your street urchins. And Oh Beauty Don't Go was our one collective line, which I said so fast that all the other kids were just inhaling breath. So it became a solo line. <laughs> and I did that a few times. I, I was, they did Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I thought, I need to be in this. It's in the choir, but I'm not in the choir. Um, okay, I'll just hang around. 
and I just hung around and moved tables and sort of uh, anointed myself stage manager. Yeah. And no, and everyone, I think the teacher thought, oh, that you've been... Someone else must have... Put someone it. said that you're going to be there. Yeah. But I just moved things, and I was very, very proactive and very useful. And then I sort of slid into the show, and at one point did have a, a line where I turned to the uh, the pharaoh, who's a great teacher called Sam Gray, mm. um, and, and I said, well, tell us about it, pharaoh, something like that. So I had one line. I was constantly collecting one lines, <laughs> and then broke into Pinewood Studios when I was 15, because I worked out that's where stuff happened, and I just thought I would get, you know, Spielberg broke into Universal, I, yeah. I got into Pinewood. He got an office and got his career going immediately. Mine flatlined for a long time <laughs> afterwards, but I had this story, and I've, I've made it work. I'm much more the slow, the fine wine approach to career. <laughs> Um, Susie Eddie is out there. A few people have listened to it already and suggested that you put that one on, on, on a slightly slower speed than normal, maybe at 0.75 on the speed. You can do that, can't you, on a lot of a lot of podcast play a lot of players. Um, can you do it on Global Player? I presume you can. Who knows? If you can't, there, there's something to bring up at the next board meeting. Um, that, but, but it's true. I mean, I talk quite quickly, but, but that, that not as quickly as, as Susie Eddie Izzard. And so, if you do want to listen to that, you may want to experiment with the uh, with the speed of the playback. Sorry to Spike, who's in Tokyo, phoned all the way. Well, I'll say hello, Spike. I haven't got time to take your call. Hello, but hello you, James. How are you? I'm all right. How are you, Spike? I'm not so, I'm not so bad. Um, no, you were talking about sleep. Um, I was, but I haven't really got time. I can give you 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got all three of the, of the conditions. Apnea, oh. talking in my sleep, and snoring. Oy. But it was... But it was the apnea that caused my partner to move out of our bed. Oh, dear. Uh, apnea, uh, just a kind of public service announcement type thing. Yeah. Apnea, um, for me, in eight hours of bedtime, I was getting about 20 minutes of actual sleep. Good Lord. I was that bad. I oh, know. I mean, uh, and did you get the machine? I got the machine. Um, Did it I work? got the machine, and for and for a week after I had the machine, my partner kept waking me up because I was so silent. Oh, no, they were they no were worried snoring. that you no weren't snoring. snoring. I got. I did warn you that I was short of time, I, but that that does seem to be a very valuable diagnosis for an awful lot of people, and indeed relationships. That is it from me for another week. It's not a bank holiday, is it, on Monday? There's a couple of around like buses at the moment, but I think I'm with you on Monday from 10, all things being equal. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back and on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can rewind live radio and enjoy the whole show podcast. All LBC's shows are there. All human life is there, indeed, including some of the world's biggest podcasts, including Full Disclosure. Uh, so download it for free from your app store or just head to globalplayer.com. Tom Swarbrick with you at four. Sheila Fogarty with you now. Or Sheila Fogarty with you now. Or Sheila Fogarty with you now. Or Sheila Fogarty with you now or she'd have 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 fogarty